Hi there, I'm Maxine Coleman. I'm the only daughter of two world-famous rocket scientists. Since I was little, I was brought along each time they made a television appearance. And my plus one was always my best friend, Gail. What's your secret to such success? Well, we've both loved science since we were kids and decided to devote our lives to it. And family is our biggest motivation. It's not rocket science. Whoa, your parents are so cool. On our way home, Dad asked me, So, what's your dream, sweetie? While I was scratching my head for an answer, Gail already said, uh, I want to be a talk show host, just like the, that lady tonight. That's great. You can definitely do it. Don't worry, Maxine. You'll soon know yours. However, both Gail and I had problems learning. While Gail struggled to say a proper sentence, reading and writing gave me the hardest time. Naturally, we both hated school. My parents took me to the doctor, and I was diagnosed with dyslexia. He also said I'd have much difficulty in school and wouldn't achieve high academic results. I was quite upset to hear that, but my pop-pop, who was a high school teacher, wasn't pleased with that remark. Nonsense. Maxine's very bright. Dyslexic or not, she'll succeed with the right method. Since then, Pop-Pop began helping me and Gail study. Each time we finished a book, he'd give us little rewards. He also introduced us to sports, and even brought us to cool places like museums, galleries, and aquariums. From the moment I stepped foot in the aquarium, I knew this place is right up my alley because... Dolphins! Look, it's following me! I immediately told my parents the good news that evening. I found my passion. I'll become a marine biologist when I grow up. Years went by, and school wasn't scary to us anymore. Thanks to my pop-pop, I'm now at the top of my class and excel at biology. Dyslexia didn't have much effect on me. Meanwhile, Gail got rid of her stutter and became much more confident. We're like Superman and Batman, always side by side, working towards our own dream. Professor Coleman, please tell us more about your latest research on marine life. Ahem, this is my life's work, which has been under development for the last decade. We both got into an elite high school, which would be a good jumping pad for our future. But, unlike in middle school where I could learn at my own pace, I had to bend over backwards to have a good GPA, since the curriculum here is so intense. Unfortunately, dyslexia returned due to stress, making things even harder for me. In class, I had to look up the dictionary every five minutes, which slowed me down. One time, I stayed in class during recess to correct all the D's and B's that I'd mixed up in my essay. That alone got me called nerd. On the contrary, the pretty, extroverted Gail already became the face of the student's council, and she still tried her best to help me. That's right, this is just a minor setback. But that's not all. Yesterday, my chemistry teacher asked me to read the lab safety rules. Don't taste or sniff. You should be wafting the spell. What? I mean, smell. Sorry. We're in chemistry class, not potions 101, Professor Snape. That's how Snape became my nickname. All because of that Robbie guy. Everyone loved his shenanigans, and he got away with everything because he's a rising track star. But really, he's the villain in my story. Lately, Gail and I had less time to chat because she's so busy. Hanging out with Robbie. They met when Gail interviewed him for the school paper. Worse still, she often defended him, saying I'd like him once I got to know the guy. Ugh, no thanks. Besides, it seems that Gail's making achievements towards her dream. Meanwhile, I could barely handle studying and getting along with my classmates. Then came a time when every student who wished for a head start into a prestigious university needed to see the college counselor, Mrs. Morales. She said that my grades were pretty good, but I'd also need a good personal statement. It's supposed to capture the essence of who I am and show that I'm ready to commit myself to my future. Simple enough, right? But when it comes to actually writing, why is it so hard? Am I doubting my own plan? Can I really be a marine biologist? At dinner, I tried to bring this up to my parents, but it seemed they're already thinking I'm a marine bio student. Guess there's no turning back now. I called Gail to the aquarium to help me clear my thoughts. She was late, so I went to catch up with my dolphin friends. They actually calmed me down. Suddenly, a screeching voice took me out. You're dyslexic because you speak dolphin's language? <gasps> Should we find dolphinese books for you? I turned around to see Gail in an entourage of her new friends and... That buffoon. They started giggling. No word in the English language could describe how mad and humiliated I was. Did you really need to bring them here just to embarrass me? I walked away, but accidentally headed to a glass tunnel. It felt like I was fully submerged underwater. The horrible memory of the time I fell through ice into the deep, dark, frozen cold water came rushing back. I immediately dashed outside. Max, wait! 
I turned around to see Gail running after me. Watch out! A car's coming! I quickly pushed her away. The car didn't hit her, but she's injured. We brought her to the hospital ASAP. But when she came to, Gail couldn't speak. Her doctor said her vocal cord was temporarily paralyzed due to neck and chest trauma. That meant Gail could no longer present the school sports day. I was overcome with guilt. Gail told me, I'll be alright. Sorry about earlier. I thought bringing our classmates would cheer you up. She even said that I should keep chasing my dream and not let anything hold me back. I was so touched. But somehow, her words made me feel so pressured. I'll even work harder from now on. After that day, Robbie kept following me around trying to apologize. I avoided him like the plague. One day, I even skipped English and when I got back, my classmates were buzzing about some substitute teacher named Mr. Coleman. They seemed so excited since he didn't make them do any work and only told them fun anecdotes. Huh? That name rings a bell. And later my suspicion was confirmed when I met with my grandpa's angry and disappointed look after school. I obviously went home to a raging storm, but it didn't matter. I used this chance to spill my guts about how exhausting school was, how annoying it was to be picked on by an absolute moron, all the time while my bestie wasn't by my side. Strangely, grandpa listened attentively, then simply said he'd handle it. A few days later, he revealed that his way of handling it was making me that dimwit's tutor. Worst idea ever! Even though Pop Pop guaranteed that clown would work with me, I still wanted to kiss that jock with an uppercut. I ranted to Gail, thinking she'd help me out of this. Unexpectedly, Gail also told me to give him a chance. Then, I might see his good side too? Right at that moment, the idiot appeared with a Nintendo Switch. How immature! That's my cue to leave. After the first lesson, I realized any regular teaching method could never hold this dummy's attention. But I can't just give up. Pop Pop taught me that there's no bad students. Fine, I'll find the right way to make him study. So, I showed him YouTube videos on biology to keep him focused, taught him the periodic table song, and talked about world history in his language. In 1914, after the Austrian Archduke was unrelieved, Australia-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and Russia was like, say less, we got you, bro. Then Germany wanted to be the main character and waged war when literally nobody asked. So, you're saying World War I started mostly because the German Empire was pressed about being mid? Yes, brother. After some time, Robbie's grades went from D and F to C and B. Well, I no longer had to cram like before, since preparing lessons for him helped me remember everything naturally. Studying suddenly wasn't so hard anymore. And maybe Gail was right. This guy wasn't that terrible after all. One afternoon, Robbie shared some good news. Hey, my track meet went so well. Thanks for helping me with my grades, or else I would have been disqualified. Let's celebrate! Congrats! Can't celebrate without Gail. I heard she just got back from the hospital. Let's come to her place and get nuts! Moderately, though. Robbie passionately talked about his great achievement, while I told Gail that we're getting along now, but Gail seemed unenthusiastic. Then she coldly asked us to leave. We were both so confused. I asked Gail's mum and found out that most of her injuries had healed, except for her vocal cord. She's undergoing treatment, but her doctor was unsure how long it would take for her to talk again. Poor girl. Suddenly, Gail rushed out to put a piece of paper in my hand, then ran away. On my way home, I read the note. It's all your fault. If you didn't run, none of this would have happened. I'd rather get hit by a car. It would have only given me a broken arm. It's you who killed my dream. That's Gail's true feelings? Her words cut deep. When Gail returned to class, she didn't talk to anyone, and of course avoided me and Robbie. One time during recess, Mrs. Morales came to me and complimented my personal statement. She even said that if I kept up my GPA, I should have it all in my bag. That means my essay didn't seem as pretentious as I thought, right? Robbie was so happy for me, but I saw Gail's glare out of the corner of my eye and immediately signaled for Robbie to keep it down. At lunchtime, he asked if I was upset because of Gail. Not really. She'll perk up when she gets better. So why the long face? Did Mrs. Morales say you have a bright future ahead of you? I'm not sure anymore. I made myself out to look like someone fully committed to marine biology in my essay, but deep down, it felt like I was lying. I can't even get close to water after... after falling through the ice that one time. I suddenly felt my throat closing and my eyes watering. I instinctively stood up and left without saying another word. I wanted to talk to my mother about this as soon as I got home, but I arrived in the middle of her conversation with Gail's mom. She brought us the good news. Voice therapy worked, and Gail could talk now. That's amazing! Gail's mom said she's waiting for me at the park, so I went straight there. At the park, I saw Gail standing by a pond. 
Thank goodness you can talk again. I always knew you'd recover for your dream. My dream? Tsk, it's turned to ashes. Then Gail told me that although she could talk again, her buttery smooth voice didn't return. Oh no, I was dead inside and tried my best to comfort her. I still believed she could overcome this and regain her voice, the same way she got over her stutter. Easy for you to say. Do you know what it's like to have a demon in your throat? I don't even recognize myself anymore. No, no, you can still- How about you? Can you get over your fear to achieve your dream? Come on now, do it! With each line, Gail put another step forward, pushing me closer till the edge, until there was only a few inches between me and the water. Go on, it's for your dream! What are you afraid of? Gail took one more step, and I fell into the pond! My trauma took over me. I panicked, thinking this was it. Then, someone pulled me out. Robbie! You're insane! She could have died! Gail just ran away crying. <laughs> Don't yell at her. I shouldn't have picked at her wound. Also, this should be a practice for when I become a marine biologist. Seriously? Or are you just scaring yourself even more? My family expects this much from me. If I gave up on my dream because of a tiny little accident from when I was 13, I only have myself to blame. Dream this, dream that. Are you sure that's what you really want to do, and not just a six-year-old girl's dream? Robbie's words jolted me awake. It's true that I no longer enjoy studying as much as when I was learning with Pop Pop. Every ounce of effort I put out recently was solely for a far-fetched dream that I'm not even sure if I want anymore. I don't want to disappoint my parents, but I can't keep struggling like this for the rest of my life. But I've held on to this dream for so long and worked so hard for it. What do I do if I give up now? You'll figure it out. Take your time. I used to play football and was sure that I'd become an NFL player. Then at one point I realized that's not my thing, so I quit. And after trying out many different things, I fell in love with track. Change isn't the end of the world. I can't believe it took me this long to realize that it's too early for me to commit. Change is normal. But what if I never find my life's ultimate goal? And I'm just wasting time. Jeez, chill, man. You're making someone like me, who couldn't care less about school, actually enjoy studying. You're living life and putting some good into the world. Ain't no time wasted. No need to be Martin Scorsese. <laughs> you mean marine biologist, right? <laughs> uh, but thank you. I needed that. I came home to see Gail crying to my very concerned parents. Mom jumped to embrace me when she saw that I was drenched. Gail told me everything. Why didn't you tell us? We're so proud of you, and nothing would ever stop us. So, Gail revealed my fear of water from that accident when I was 13, and how much I tried to overcome that fear for my childhood dream. It's so difficult for me to talk about it, mostly because I can't admit to myself that accident left a scar on me, so I'd suppressed my pain all this time. Telling both my parents about it now actually felt liberating. Luckily, they're very understanding, and allowed me time to find my true calling. As for Gail, I'm sorry. I was so frustrated with myself that I put it all on you. It's not your fault. Turned out, when Gail ran off, she was hiding behind a bush nearby and overheard my conversation with Robbie. His surprisingly wise take moved her as well. Gail said she'd keep doing therapy for as long as it'd take. Yes, I believe in you. If voice therapy doesn't work out, becoming a heavy metal rock star doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> wow, really? I thought Robbie was talking for a second there. After that, it was business as usual, but there's less pressure on me. I actually made a new friend this year and got closer to my best friend. Gail's voice is improving, and she's also having fun exploring other avenues besides talk show host now. Summer came in the blink of an eye, and I decided to volunteer at a school for students with learning disabilities. I wanted to help other dyslexic people like me learn to the best of their ability, the same way Pop Pop helped me. It sounds like a good start for my own self-discovery journey. That could be my dream job. If it's not, I'll keep looking. It's finally the first day at the aquarium. And to say I'm nervous is an understatement. Stay calm, you can do this. <sighs> You're Ariel, not Naira. I'm headstrong, spirited, and... Okay, let's get into character. Bright smile, check. Friendly manner, check. Ariel's accent, check. I was a dazzling mermaid and even let the little kids stick their stickers on my fishtail while I answered a bazillion questions about Atlantica and my prince, Eric. The last visitor was the sweetest little girl who handed me a collectible box of cutlery as a gift. Oh my, such a lovely comb, but it looks rare. Are you sure your guardians would agree to this? Of course, my brother always says yes to me. 
The little girl signaled someone in the crowd to come over. And it was Arson? As in the cutest boy from school? Naira? Oh my god. Your take on Ariel is spot on. I didn't know there was a side of you. I... What are you talking about? I know not of this Naira. Feeling the panic rise in me, I lifted my fishto costume and ran with my two feet as all the kids stared in shock. I'd never wanted to disappoint those kids, but I had the biggest crush on Arson, and no way had I expected him to be there and see me like this. <sighs> At school, I was a loser, a nobody. Yet, when I was acting, I felt invincible. At least, I did until my timid, introverted side got in the way of my performing dreams. That day, our drama club mentor announced our school play this year would be Legally Blonde. I loved that movie so much, and I already knew all the lines. I couldn't let this opportunity pass me by, so when the mentor asked who wanted to audition as the lead, Elle Woods, I took all the courage and raised my hand. The whole room fell silent and suddenly burst into laughter. Oh please, how could a loser like you play the glamorous Elle Woods? Worst of all, the mentor agreed with her and said that I might be better suited for the nail lady role. And then she said the lead should go to someone who's outgoing and influential, like Eliza. What? Eliza's got the emotional range of a teaspoon. I gotta get this role. So I waited until the end of the meeting and then spoke to the mentor in private. I'm sorry, but I can't cast an Elle Woods with stage fright. Naira, I'll consider giving you the role, but only if you can prove to me that you can do this without your fear getting the better of you. So, try practicing by going out in public and interacting with strangers. Get yourself comfortable in front of a crowd. Can you do that? Feeling determined, I went to look for some kind of social experiment right away. And that's why I applied for this job at the aquarium. But I never thought anyone from class would show up. Least of all, Arson. He even caught up with me at school the next day, insisting he saw me at the aquarium. And typical me, being all fidgety and shy, I blurted out, maybe you mistook me for my twin sister, Cora. Oh, in that case then, can I get her number? Or can you like, arrange for me to go on a date with her? The way she glowed with confidence was amazing. Wow, I didn't expect him to be that into my acting. How ironic. Wait, what if I continue to play Cora and go on a date with him? I could practice my acting as this unapologetically outgoing girl while spending time with him? Tempting, right? Okay, wait at the book cafe near school on Sunday, 3 p.m. I'll tell Cora about it. I'd been preparing for this date the whole week. After watching multiple tutorials on YouTube, I was finally able to put together this bold look. All that's left to do was to wear Cora's self-confidence to match it. So I did a Bella Hadid runway strut into the cafe, straight past the gawping onlookers and over to Arson's seat and interrupted him from his reading. Hi, is that a Rick Riordan's book? Uh, yeah, Heroes of Olympus. Are you a fan of Riordan too? Are you kidding me? I've read all of his works. Yes, Breaking the Ice, success. We connected over our shared love of fantasy novels and other nerdy things. I didn't want the date to ever end, so I invited him along to a secret place of mine. I covered his eyes until we got there. Being the cute guy he was, he went along with it, even though he looked unsure about what was happening. When I turned the lights on and the ice rink appeared, his face lit up. Then the snow began to fall. It felt like a scene out of Frozen. Then we went onto the ice and... Arson fell straight onto his butt. <laughs> Stop laughing, this is my first time, okay? Aww, embarrassed Arson was so cute. <laughs> I helped him up and it was the first time our hands touched. I led him around the rink and taught him some moves. When I looked at him, I saw him looking back at me with this big grin on his face. Then suddenly he pulled me in and I fell right into his embrace. Our faces were so close and I swore we were about to kiss. Ugh. Overcome with nerves, I pushed him away, and he lost his balance and fell flat on the ice. But he jumped up to his feet right away and skidded after me. Oh, don't let me catch you, or else. Let's see you try. <laughs> Yesterday felt like a dream. We texted each other nonstop up until the last class of the day. P.E. My eyes were still glued to my phone when a flying ball hit my knee. It was from Eliza. Right after that, another one came and knocked my glasses off. I shielded myself with my arms and hoped it would go away soon, and surprisingly, it did. Only, Arson was standing in front of me, blocking all the balls. Arson, what are you doing there? We were just playing around. <laughs> P. 
playing around? Can't you see you're hurting her? Then Arson turned to me and asked me if I was okay. Could this be it? Did he realize I was the girl he went on a date with? Oh, thank you for helping me out. You're my friend, and also Cora's sister, so I've got to look out for you, right? Oh, he didn't recognize me. That meant my acting was flawless, right? Then why did I feel so uneasy about it? As uncomfortable as I felt about the situation, I also liked Arson way too much to stop it. So I continued pretending to be Cora. He acted so lovey-dovey on our dates, and it made my heart melt. But at school, he only saw me as Cora's helpless, clumsy sister. He talked about her constantly, and stared blankly into space as if there were an imaginary Cora there. It started bugging me that Arson only liked the confident, fun, and spontaneous heroine I'd created. Not coy Naira. <sighs> I couldn't blame him though. Eve, I didn't find myself lovable. Maybe that's why mom left me and didn't bother to write or to call. I couldn't do this anymore. I couldn't feed Arson with false expectations of an unreal character. So I typed out a text to Arson telling him that Cora was on her way to study abroad for three years and that this relationship wouldn't work. Arson kept texting back non-stop and even came to my house to look for Cora and broke down in tears when I told him she'd already left. I felt so bad, but that was the only way for him to stop fantasizing about Cora. Over time, his pain would fade, right? From that day on, Arson always looked for me at school and consistently asked about her. This didn't go unnoticed by Eliza, who was clearly green with envy. Lunchtime came, and Eliza, along with her minions, suddenly approached me. Why so lonely? Has Arson abandoned you? <laughs> I tried to ignore her and eat my lunch, but she wouldn't leave me alone. Fine then, I'll lend you a hand. Arson, hi! Did you know that Naira here is so obsessed with you? She even admits that she loves to follow you everywhere like a stalker. How creepy. Huh? What was this girl saying? Now people were staring at me, judging me for something that wasn't even true. I was done with being Naira, the loser. If only, yeah, if only Cora's personality helped me stand up for myself. Shut up! Me and Arson are friends, so what? Why do you have to make stuff up about me? Is it because you're jealous of me? Oh, what? Me? Jealous of you? You like Arson, don't you? I feel sorry for you, really. You're gonna pick on everyone he talks to? How pathetic. Just like that, people made disapproving comments at Eliza. She couldn't do anything other than run away in shame while I suddenly received praise for standing up against the school's tyrant. People seemed to love this new side of me, so perhaps it was a good time to give myself a makeover. The next day at school, I started dressing up boldly and wearing contact lenses instead of nerdy glasses. My classmates seemed to like my new look. My drama club mentor changed her attitude towards me as well. I even applied for the student council and my popularity grew, and so did my friendship circle. The world opened up to me, but weirdly, being around people all the time just felt uncomfortable and exhausting. I couldn't really talk to any of them, as we weren't even close. I just felt so left out. When it came to a charity date auction, being on the council committee meant that I was appointed a bachelorette. That meant everyone joining this event would bid to take me on a date, and that bidding money would go to the school's fund to build a new cafeteria. That's how I ended up here, on stage at the auction. I tried my best to act cool to raise as much money as possible, the boys kept cheering for me, trying to show their charms, and I tried to flirt back by talking nonsense and winking at them. Once the bidding started, chaos commenced as people kept raising their paddle numbers. 40, 60, 80. It suddenly came to me that I didn't want to go on dates with any of these guys. I didn't know them at all. And just then, Arson shouted from the back. 500. 500 going once, going twice, and sold. Arson jumped on stage, grabbed my hand, and dragged me out of there. He led me to the garden, and then he started asking me tons of questions. What is it with you lately? It's as if you're someone else. N no way! I'm just the same old Naira! Tell me the truth. Are you... Cora? You switch places with your sister to protect her, right? Oh, Cora, I've missed you so much! After all this time, he was still in love with Cora? Even now, when I changed myself... He still didn't see me as Naira? Arson, I... I can't. And then I just ran out of there. After a night of crying myself to sleep, I was back at school, 
and found myself summoned to the principal's office with a smirking Eliza. There she showed the principal a video recording of my conversation with Arson last night, which was proof that someone else had been replacing me at school. If this was true, I could be expelled. Oh no, no, no! Panic! I blurted out a lie that I had bipolar and that sometimes I switched to the other persona and acted up. The principal seemed confused, but then she insisted I go to the school therapist. <sighs> I had no choice but to agree. And it was actually really good for me. Through talking to the therapist, I could finally open up about my past. Ever since I was a kid, I've always been super shy. I thought it was why my mom left me behind when she split from dad and moved out. She hadn't even contacted me once. I know a childish nerd like me would never be the one who she could really talk to. Thank God my dad came to pick me up after that. The thought of facing my so-called friends on the bus was making me nauseous. Were you that unhappy not having your mother around? I just don't know why she left me behind without a word. Was I a loser in her eyes? Honey, listen. Mom loves you. And the reason you didn't receive any letters from her was because I hid them all from you. What? Why would you do that? Because I was so broken after your mom left that I thought it would be better if you and I could forget everything about her. I... I'm sorry. Don't you know how terrible I felt about myself all those years just because of your selfishness? I ran into the house immediately. I couldn't look at him right now, only to see Mom and Cora were sitting in the living room. Both rushed towards me and pulled me in for a hug. Yeah, the Cora character wasn't entirely made up. Instead, I based her on my real life twin sister. The little five-year-old me always struck by Cora's side hid behind her dress while she boldly stood up against anyone who dared to pick on me. I'd always looked up to her. Turned out, when Dad got the call from school, he realized his actions had caused me pain. So he did everything in his power to contact Mom and brought her and Cora from LA to here. Mom kept apologizing to me, saying she regretted every minute of leaving me behind. Seeing them all break down in tears like that ached my heart, but it gave me this warm feeling at the same time. After all this time, my family feud was finally resolved. Just at that moment, the doorbell rang. It's Arson! Naira, is that your boyfriend? What? I dragged him away immediately, and this time I admitted the whole truth to him. I told him how I lied that the girl in the aquarium was Cora, because I didn't think he'd like the real me, as I wasn't a confident presence. But my feelings for him were real, and that's why I tried so hard to get close to him. But I figured now that he knew the truth, it'd be over, so I'd just walk away. Finally, I'm back. I've been in LA for an entire winter break to spend more time with Mom and Cora, and to figure myself out. I realized that being an introvert is nothing to be self-conscious about. I'm observant, and that'll help a lot of my acting passion, right? This semester, I'll definitely try to impress my drama club mentor. No boys will ever distract me again. And that's when I spotted Arson waving at me with a huge bouquet in his hand. Arson, what are you doing here? I thought you were still mad at me. Well, I thought about it a lot, and honestly, things between us got messy, so I'd like to get to know you again. Only this time, please can it be the real you, as I really want to know what Naira's about. What do you say? Um, yeah, I'd love that. Hi, Mia here. Not to brag, but since childhood, I've always been kinda a genius. I've already stacked up over 20 science-based awards, and by adding this one more trophy into my collection, I even got to skip a grade. Your achievements at such a young age are admirable. What's your plan next? Well, I've decided to drop out of school. Yep, that's my plan. With as impressive of a profile, I'm just one research paper away from being accepted onto the Space Up Astronomical Research Program. Why waste time on boring classes, right? But ugh, mom and dad didn't like the idea of me not graduating. So after a lot of compromises, I did get to move to Quebec with my grandparents for a year. But I still had to go to school there. And voila, here I am in Canada, ready to conquer my dream. But why was there this angry crowd in front of my new home? They were screaming, cursing, vandalizing. My grandparents secretly signaled me inside the back way, then glumly told me how the crowd were parents of the children who got food poisoning after attending Riverside School summer camp. The problem was, the food was provided by my grandparents' farm, and now the school is threatening to file a lawsuit and doesn't seem to be open for negotiation. 
That can't be. There must be a solution for this. So gathering up my courage, I knocked on the principal's door. Do I know you? Um, I don't think so, ma'am. I'm Mia Jones, granddaughter of Mr. Peterson, the rancher. Wait, Mia Jones from New York? Hmm, come in. The woman must have been Mrs. Robinson, the principal's wife. But does she know me? As soon as we sat down, she said, I will withdraw the charges for you. Oh, ma'am, really? I knew we could sort this out amicably. Oh, but my sweet child, I don't do charity. I know what you're capable of, so I will only drop the lawsuit if you make my daughter the top student at school. In other words, you'll exchange all test results with her. What do you think? What do I think? I think that's a crazy proposition. But if I didn't do this, then the form would go under. So, with a reluctant nod, I agreed. Then I was immediately taken to meet her daughter. I was expecting someone snooty and spoiled, but to my surprise, this super smiley girl greeted me. Hey, I'm Eliana, but just call me Elle. I'm so sorry about my mom. She's got it into her head that I need to excel at school, since my dad is the principal. Elle hesitated for a bit, then continued. Also, there's Nora, the super smart daughter of my dad's ex. Mom doesn't want me to suck and dad to favor this other girl over me, so... Thinking about it, my main purpose for coming here was to complete my astronomical research. I don't need any more A. So, I smiled at Elle. Don't worry, I'll make sure you're the star student in no time. The next morning, I went to school with Elle, and wow, it looked so ancient and calm. Definitely distinctive from my stuffy school in New York. Elle introduced me to her friends and they all seemed really welcoming. It's gonna be great here. Still holding the deal, I helped Elle answer the teacher's questions, exchanged assignments and homework with her, and soon, Elle had already climbed up to the top rank. On the contrary, I was at the bottom of the class. Oh wow, Elle's mom really wasn't kidding when she said her grades were bad. But that didn't matter to me anyway. Cause the only thing I care about is this amazing astronomy tower. Talk about heaven! What are you doing here? I turned around to see Nora, the girl Elle had mentioned before, who is also the astronomy club's president. Hi, I'm Mia. I want to be part of your team. I have experience in studying astronomy and... Stop blabbering. Your grades suck and we have a strict no idiots allowed policy. I told Nora to at least give me a chance to prove myself, so she sat me down and sniggered as she handed me an astronomy test. Easy peasy, I got all the answers right in just 10 minutes. But instead of welcoming me into the club, she accused me of cheating. Ugh! Nora didn't just dislike me, she also seemed to despise Elle too. Any chance she got to call us out on something, she would definitely take it. Sir, they're cheating! I... I just want to help Mia. Please, I'm so sorry. Huh? Who was helping who? Mia, you've got a lot of nerve. Your test is suspended. The whole class was giving me disapproving looks. Being this disrespected by my peers was a new experience for me. How could Elle tell like so calmly? Great, now that I was labeled a cheater, I would never get accepted into the astronomy club ever. Mia the cheater just had to find her way to get in there then. So, I waited until dark then sneaked into the janitor's room to steal the key to the observation tower. <sighs> now I could freely study my favorite constellation without any interruptions. Montreal is close to the North Pole, so the night sky here is so clear that I could see all the stars. At this rate, my research could be done faster than expected. Then I would be out of here, leaving all of these childish rivalry dramas behind. One night, I was busy taking notes when someone opened the door and walked in. Who's there? Oh no! I hastily grabbed my papers and escaped through the emergency exit door. Who is the guy? Why is he here at this hour? The next morning, I pushed my way through the noisy crowd and saw the announcement on the school's pin board. The astronomy club warned outsiders not to use the observatory room and that there would be severe punishment once the recent trespasser was discovered. Shoot, the guy from last night must have snitched on me. Turned out, the snitch was Brandon, the new transfer student, and also the grandson of the founder of Space Up. It's a shame the incredible Sir Edward Foster's grandson was such a smug jerk. But that didn't stop all the girls from going cuckoo crazy for this Brandon guy. The ironic thing is, he kept on coming over to me and talking about astronomy. Huh? Doesn't everyone here see me as an insignificant kid? Is this yours? Brandon said while holding out a piece of paper. 
Oh my, this was part of my astronomy research. Did I drop it in the tower that night? But how did Brandon know it was mine? Flustered, I quickly made an excuse and left. I couldn't stop worrying about Brandon finding out I was the one who used the observatory room. If anyone knows about it, it'd be an instant suspension. I was busy thinking when suddenly the whole class burst into applause. As it turned out, they were praising my excellent essay on constellations. Well, it's known as Elle's essay now. Then the teacher turned to read the class's worst essay. My favorite star is Justin Bieber. Every time I see him, I think if only he was my husband. Everyone started laughing. <sighs> no prize for guessing whose name was on this one. Mia, I suggest you learn something from your friend Elle. I turned to look at Elle and saw her smug face. She even joined in with the others to make fun of me. Was she really that stupid to write that essay? Or did she intend to embarrass me? When I got home, Elle was already waiting on the porch to apologize to me. I helped you as promised. Shouldn't your mom keep her promise too? Get the lawsuit dismissed now. Then I'll help you finish your final exam successfully. Else, I'm not doing it. She's on it, Mia. Don't worry. I know you're leaving after a year anyway. And I also know that you're the one who snuck into the observatory. So, if you want to leave peacefully, at least help me and Brandon to get together. You and Brandon? But what does it have to do with me? Elle then told me that Brandon was so impressed by her astronomy essay that he asked her out to discuss it further. But of course, she knew nothing about it, so she had a plan. I'll have my hair pot on, and you gotta stay on the line with me throughout the date so you can tell me the answers to his questions. If we become official, I'll buy you that telescope you bang on about so much. You know, that thingy-majiggy. Celestron! Celestron Telescope! Oh man, she really knew my weak spot. Alright then, we have a deal. That weekend, Elle and Brandon went for a walk in Jerry Park while I stayed at home eavesdropping on their conversation through the phone. I see you have a passion for the Astros, so why didn't you join the Astronomy Club? Just cause I'm busy with my studies, and I also have piano practice, you know. Really? Oh, in the paper, you mentioned the black hole Sagittarius A. You seem to have done a lot of research about it. Could you tell me more? Although Elle seemed frantic having me put words in her mouth, everything went pretty smoothly. Only one thing. The more Brandon and I talked, the more I realized we had so much in common. Even if it was through Elle, I still felt a connection with him. I thought everything was going well between them, but no. One day, Elle came to me in a fit of anger and said Brandon had turned down her love confession. I want you to go talk to him and figure out why. I need to know the reason. What? Why don't you just ask him? Because I'm me, Eliana Robinson. I don't ask such embarrassing questions. So I was the one who had to make the embarrassing move? Also, call me. I want to hear it myself. Gosh, this bossy girl. And so, I had to drag Brandon to the quiet rooftop while my phone was secretly on a call with Elle so she could follow the conversation. Okay, let's get straight to the point. Why did you reject Elle? Um, because I like someone else? If you already like someone else, then why hang out with her? Because only when I go out with Elle, I can talk to the person I like. It's disappointing though. Why don't you recognize me? I quickly ended the call hoping L didn't understand what was going on. He already knew I was behind L's words all this time? It turned out Brandon had met me once in the city's ranking contest for students in 6th grade, in which I surpassed him and won the first prize. He'd never met a kid smarter than him in astronomy before, so when he saw me again at school, he instantly recognized me. Only, he couldn't understand why my score was so low. Brandon wanted to talk to me, but he said that all he received was a cold shoulder. I felt a bit guilty, but it's all because he told the school administration I snuck into the astronomy room. But it turned out Nora was the one who reported me. Nora was there at the time too. By the way, why do you have to do Elle's homework? I told Brandon about my contract with Mrs. Robinson and apologized for not thinking about his feelings when I agreed to be behind his and Elle's date. I see. Follow me. There's something you should know. Brandon took me to see Nora. She didn't welcome me at first, but when Brandon told her about my secret, Nora immediately changed her attitude. I should've known. Someone like Elle couldn't make such progress. She and her mom are deceiving everyone again. 
Then, Nora told me how she was secretly investigating the food poisoning case because, on the day of summer camp, she saw Mrs. Robinson and Elle doing something shady in the school kitchen. Why should I trust you? Elle told me that you have it in for her. So maybe you're just trying to ruin her life. <sighs> Please, why do I have to do that? Believe it or not, your precious best friend is trying to embarrass you in front of the whole school. What is this? In the lecture hall, Elle was sitting in front of a screen which said, Mia's grandpa poisoned us? We rushed to the lecture hall to find her there, telling people that my grandparents were the ones that catered spoiled food. And that I had no shame copying her works, cheating many times, and even stealing Brandon from her while they were dating. So she must have figured out that Brandon liked me, huh? Even so, why didn't she talk to me directly? How dare she make things up about me and my family? Before I could do anything, Brandon changed what was on the screen to a video of me winning the Young Minds Intelligence Contest. Everybody started buzzing when they recognized who I was. Someone even spoke loudly. I watched that show. Is that really Mia? Elle's face turned pale as people started doubting her. Then Nora snatched the mic from Elle's hand and said, So, now we've made it clear that Mia isn't dumb at all. Then what about the poisoning at the camp? Did anyone find it strange how only Elle and her mother showed no sign of poisoned symptoms that day? That's cause they were the ones who poisoned the food and blamed it on Mia's grandparents. The screen continued to show a clip of Elle's mom looking shady as she spoke to some man. She did all that just to ruin Mia's grandparents' good reputation. Then she would hire this man to buy the farm on her behalf for a ridiculously low price. What did you say? Oh my god, the principal has been standing at the door and witnessed everything! Everyone, out! When there were only four of us left in the room, Elle furiously shouted, How dare you! You're just the outcome of your cheater mom, remember? Don't play dumb with me. You're well aware that my mom didn't cheat on Mr. Robinson, and that your mom is the one who lied to him to ruin his and my mom's wedding. And then what? Lying again that you're his daughter to force him to stay with her? You and your mom are awful people. Mr. Robinson stood in between them and stopped the argument. Oh, he didn't look too well either. Turns out, he already knew Nora's mom was wrongfully framed, and didn't cheat on him at all. And that's why he always tried to make it up to Nora. But learning that Elle wasn't his daughter was one big bombshell. After knowing what his wife and daughter did, he decided to resign. He made amends with Nora's mom and they're giving it another go. After the truth came out, Elle and her mom left without a trace. I say, good riddance to bad news. My grandparents were cleared of the food poisoning allegations and now their business is booming again. With Brandon and Nora's help, I collected enough data and finished my assignment with flying colors. Now to quit high school and pursue my dreams. Heh, <laughs> just kidding. I'm just going on a short trip to Mont Megantic National Park to see the Northern Lights with Brandon and Nora. I've decided to stay and finish high school here, so I can continue pursuing my passion for astronomy with my two soulmates by my side. Hey, I'm Madison, and I was born into a well-off family. My parents are successful entrepreneurs who always fulfill their dearest daughter's wishes. Beautiful face, supermodel figure, I have both. But unfortunately, I'm not the only one. I have a limelight-hogging twin sister, Olivia. Since elementary school, my sister has won loads of trophies for her singing. Everyone was so spellbound by her that they seemed to completely forget about me. And it didn't help when mom dressed us the same. Meanwhile, dad was always like, Whoa, I can barely tell my two princesses apart. Maddie, if your sister is tied up with her singing, you could help fill in her place in class. <laughs> Ugh, it's not funny at all. Especially when that kind of came true. Later at 14, when I was still trying to figure out what today's homework was, my sister went and won the voice kids. At school, everyone kept giving me gifts and praises just to walk off on me as soon as they realized I wasn't Olivia. Hey, it's not like I intentionally tricked them. Trust me, I'm just as sick and tired of all this as everyone else, so I decided to take action. Ta-da! Did you recognize me? Still Madison here. The one-of-a-kind Madison with pixie hair, smoky eyes, nude lipstick, and this edgy outfit. I look different, right? But... Oh, are you cosplaying Olivia and her upcoming MV? Madison, you're ruining your sister's image! I tried to be different from her, but it couldn't change the fact that I'm the twin sister of a famous singer. 
There's so many things I wanted to do. But just imagine if I tried out for the cheerleading team or a modeling contest. People would be, look at the tragic Olivia wannabe. <sighs> The name Olivia gradually became something that haunted me, and now she's constantly gaining in fame while I remain in her shadow. I have my own dream of becoming a model too, and I've gone to every audition I could, but so far, no luck. Oh right, let's check out my new video! Maybe YouTube will be the Kickstarter for my rise to fame! Remember to remove your makeup thoroughly, and the last step is, subscribe to my channel to stay updated with the latest makeup trends! It's only been 10 hours, but look at this. Here are over 200,000 views and 1,000 comments. Yay! Let's see. Like if you watch this just because you thought this was Olivia. When you're boring, but you have a famous sister. Olivia, you're the goat. Please reply to my comment. What on earth is going on here? No one talked about the video content. It's all about Olivia. Why can't I get rid of that name? I am Madison. Frustrated, I closed the laptop to leave, but turned around to see the mean girls surrounding me. Silly, you should have titled it Skincare Tips from Olivia's Sister. There would have been millions of views by now. Someone with no talent like you should just stay in the dark, please. Shut up, just wait. One day y'all gonna become my fans too. Finally, what a long day. But isn't every beginning tough? Me quitting would be exactly what those mean girls wanted, so I can't give up now. I was struggling to set up my camera when mom opened the door and peeked in. You started a YouTube channel? Why not ask your sister to help promote it? Ah, uh, but no worry. Everyone can obviously see that you're Olivia's sister. You'll probably receive a gold button soon anyway. Ugh, what do you know? I don't even need her help. And please stop entering my room without knocking. Nobody acknowledges my effort just because I look like her. Fine then, just wait and see. In two more months, I'll be 18 and be able to do one thing I've been dreaming of. That will put an end to all this unfairness I had to suffer. This is it, the moment I've been waiting for. Right here, right now, I'll be reborn. I'm ready to start my life anew. You can open your eyes and look at yourself, Ms. Lewis. <sighs> okay, three, two, one. O-M-G in the mirror. A beautiful face, a stranger, not like Olivia's or anyone I ever know. Finally, I can live my life with my famous sister out of my way. Hmm, I wonder how my parents would react to this face that I myself don't even recognize. Hey, I'm home. Hello, but who are you? It's Madison, aren't you? What happened? Did you get plastic surgery? Plastic surgery? Didn't you say you were on vacation with your friends? Your beautiful face. Why did you? You mean Olivia's beautiful face. I'm done living in her shadow. Then I ran straight to my room, leaving them there all stunned. The next morning at school, all the girls' curious eyes were on me. And the boys? Needless to say, people were buzzing around. But there was no Olivia nor Madison to be heard. Nobody recognized me. I am the one and only now. Hey, Angel. Are you lost? Let me show you around. Since when did this mean girl become so friendly? You moving here is the right decision. Our school is the best in the state. Boring! If it weren't for my parents' new investment in this area, I wouldn't be at this shabby place. This fame-seeking silly girl instantly bought my bluffing. Her eyes widened, looking at me like a puppy. Then she did everything I asked her to. Buying me sodas, carrying my bag for me, and even wiping my seat. <laughs> Suddenly, Alicia walked over and nudged Zara. Where have you been? I told you to get me a latte. And who's she? Oh, this is my new bestie. And you should go get your latte yourself, as I'll be busy showing my friend here around, right? Alicia's frown face was a picture. <laughs> what a solid friendship these mean girls have. But the fun had only just begun. As the teacher did a roll call, I raised my hand up at the sound of Madison Lewis. The whole class gasped, and you betcha, Alicia and Zara's bewildered faces were hilarious. Didn't see that coming, huh? By recess, the whole school had heard the breaking news. Me, Madison, just got plastic surgery. Some were showering me with flattery, while some just kept judging the size of my eyes or my nose bridge, blah, blah, blah. But no one compared me to Olivia anymore. They just forgot about my famous twin sister. That's all I need. Madison is unique. Ouch! What's wrong with you? Are you blind? It was you going the wrong way, Madison. Um, he looks so familiar, but I still can't think of his name. He's... It's Dylan. Have you seriously forgotten my name already? That's right! My old neighbor Dylan! His family must have moved back to town again. But 
How could you recognize me right away? You look a bit different, but I can still tell from your voice. Forget the past. I'm the new Madison, the best version of Madison. Then I walked away from him. Now I'm finally free to do whatever I want without being compared to Olivia. I easily got that cheerleading captain title. From this spot, I can see all the impressed spectators and Zara's look of fury. <laughs> she was the former captain who got dethroned by me. Then I went on and won the school beauty contest too. Alicia's boyfriend, Sid, even dumped her to chase after me. Who's the loser now, girl? But of course, a jerk like him didn't interest me, so I bluntly rejected him in front of everyone. One afternoon while I was going home, Sid jumped out of nowhere and blocked my way. Babe, girls are lining up to date me, but I picked you. Be my girl and you'll see. Come on, just one dinner. Let go of me. Suddenly, a big-looking guy rushed in, scared Sid off, and then offered to take me home. He introduced himself as Isaac, and turns out we were in the same chemistry class. Oh god, how come I never noticed this handsome boy? Probably chemistry had sucked the life out of me every time I entered that lab room, but it's okay. We can rebuild our chemistry here now. After that day, we texted each other all of the time, and a week later, we became an item. Fast, yes, but when you know, you know. Isaac took care of me during workouts, waited in the salon for hours, and even kept me updated with fashion trends. He's just perfect. But one time, when we walked hand in hand at the mall, I caught sight of Dylan's cold face. I suddenly felt awkward and tried to avoid his gaze. Strange, but why bother? Isaac and I were too busy discussing our upcoming plans anyway. I finally released my second video, and no one mentioned Olivia, but Gigi, Bella, Lily Maymac? Now they're seeing me like those hot girls? Ridiculous! And talk kept coming about how I look like other stars. Maybe she brought their photos and asked the surgeon to copy them, but no way can Replica compete with the original. Still, isn't it better to resemble your own sibling than being some stranger's copycat? <laughs> so, did I really look like a carbon copy of someone else? Again? I rush to Isaac. He's the only one I can trust. Uh, just a little, babe. But if you don't like it, there's always a way. So I continued to undergo many other surgeries to find the perfect, unique Madison. Isaac was always there to encourage me. He was the one who suggested what part I should fix next. Sharper jawline, thinner nose, fuller lips. He has an eye for this, right? Seems like your eyes still need some fixing. I'll take you there next week. More? I know Isaac only wanted the best for me, but after pouring my fortune on endless plastic surgeries, I was completely broke, and no way would my parents agree to lend me some. Why not ask Isaac, you wonder? I can't do that. I'm not a gold digger. The surgery appointment was coming up, but I still couldn't gather enough money. What to do? What's wrong? Fighting with your guy? Desperate to offload, I blurted out my problem. So, could you help me out? I'll pay you back as soon as possible. I don't know why you think you need all this surgery. If Isaac really loved you, no way would he make you do this. Let me knock some sense into this dude. Dylan seemed so mad. I tried to pull his hand, but to no avail. Thank goodness someone blocked him. That's Olivia. I don't know what she said, but Dylan calmed down and went inside. Then Olivia walked towards me. You're already so pretty, Madison. Don't mind what others say. You guys don't know me at all. I'd rather be weirdly ugly than be pretty, but look the same as someone else. I don't want to be a copy of anyone. Then I stormed off immediately. Waking up after a restless night, I was reaching my phone to call Isaac, then saw an envelope of money on the nightstand. Is this from Olivia? Why did she... Never mind. No time to think, else I'm going to be late for my appointment. Look, my face has healed just in time for my graduation ceremony. Pretty, huh? But I haven't been able to bring myself to be happy at all, as it's been over a month since Isaac ghosted me. After the eye surgery that day, Isaac insisted I have my nose fixed too. I said I needed more time to recover, but he got annoyed and just left. I've been looking forward to this graduation, which is compulsory for everyone, so he won't be able to avoid me anymore. My parents came too, but probably for Olivia, and today's spotlight is definitely hers. Suddenly, the crowd surrounding my sister gravitated to something else. Hang on, Isaac? Oh. My. God. Standing next to him is a girl who looks exactly like me! And her dress is identical to the one Isaac once gave me. I rushed over to confront him, but he flung me away. Wow, how buzzing! Both the real deal and the knockoff are here. Can you even tell them apart, Isaac? Stop saying nonsense. My princess is the one and only. Hey, you really do look a lot like me. Who are you? 
So after countless surgeries, I was still a doppelganger? All I want is just to be myself, to be unique. Why is it so hard? I felt rage filling up my body. I ran to the restroom to calm myself down, but it didn't help because I overheard the truth. Isaac and Naomi broke up when she moved abroad with her family. Guess she's back now. Yeah, how much he must love her to do all this. Great, now I get it. Isaac only wanted me to get plastic surgery to look like Naomi. But once his ex is back, he threw me away like a broken toy. So the gossip girls at school are definitely not missing out on this chance to mock me. Girls, stop! My sister, it's you who needs to stop. Don't you know you're the cause of everything? Calm down, Madison. It's completely normal to look like someone. To me, and to your family, you've always been the one and only Madison. No! I've never been seen as the only one! Then I told Dylan everything I'd bottled up inside. Why I absolutely needed plastic surgery. Why I was so obsessed with the fact that I resembled my sister. Everybody had always thought of me merely as Olivia's shadow. I never knew that's how you felt. I'm sorry, Madison. We are such bad parents. Startled, I turned around to see everyone. Madison, I've never looked down on you. I only thought I could use my reputation to make things easier for you. We always try to do the best we can for you two. We thought this change in appearance was what you wanted. If only we'd realized the painful reason behind it. Oh, wow. They actually cared this much about me? I cried even louder and ran straight into their open arms. Maybe Dylan was right. Maybe I really am special just for who I am, not for what I look like. The next day, I went to school to clear out my locker. High school is over. Now I can shake off all the bad memories I had here. Let's start things anew. Oh, finally found you. Um, Naomi, right? I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to copy you. I didn't know. It's all right. I know it wasn't your fault. I swear, I had no idea Isaac was that much of a jerk. I immediately dumped him and exposed him online. How could he think us girls are just replaceable items? He even had the cheek to cry and beg me. But men like him don't ever deserve to be near us. I thought you'd be angry with me. For what? Madison, I'm truly sorry for what you had to go through. But everything has a bright side to it, don't you think? What do you think about having another twin sister? My dream of becoming a star on a runway has finally come true. But the most amazing thing was finding a companion with the same passion as me, who's none other than my new identical twin, Naomi. Bet no one can tell us apart. Miss Madison Lewis, would you go on a date with me after this? Oh, but I'm Naomi. Don't ever think you can fool me, Madison. You've always been different in my eyes. enjoying my perfect Friday night watching my favorite YouTuber's latest video when it got interrupted by a phone call. Tessa, the cops arrested me! Dress as my mom and come bail me out! That was Katie, my annoying cousin. She's the biggest troublemaker I know, which is why my aunt sent her to live at my house, in hopes that we could help change her attitude. Poof! So now I have to sneak into mom's closet and borrow some of her clothes. Hmm. How do I apply makeup to look older? Ugh, that'll have to do. So, officer, what trouble's she in this time? She vandalized a car. Not me, mom. Blame the dumb car that got in my way. Jeez, if I were really Katie's mom, I would let her rot in jail until she came to her senses. I was about to lead Katie out of there when a boy grinned at me and said, Madam, can you bail me out too? Sorry, but no. You're not my problem. Okay, well, then can you at least give me your number? I spotted Katie frown at him, then she pulled on my arm. Let's go home, Mom. Katie, can't you grow up? I can't cover for you forever. You'll do it, else I may just accidentally slip out your little secrets to your parents. Ugh, that threat sure is getting old. Okay, so I didn't bail out Katie out of choice. You see, she has something over me. The thing is, I have a passion for baking, but my parents think this is a waste of time. I knew they'd never knowingly pay for my cooking classes, so I told them I needed money to join an extra study class. I know it sounds bad, but I did apply to work at a coffee shop bakery so I could pay them back while also gaining experience. 
But then Katie discovered my secret, and now she's using it to control me. <sighs> then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I arrived home to find my parents waiting up for me in the living room. Tessa, you were out partying, weren't you? Why do you keep on disobeying us? And is that my dress? Why can't you be more like Katie? She's really improved her grades. I turned around to see that Katie was nowhere to be seen. She must have quickly escaped through the back door to her room. What a minx. But my parents still believed she's the golden girl. Poof. It's rubbish, of course. The good grades she brought home were all by cheating. If it weren't for Katie knowing my secret, I so would have exposed her by now. Actually, besides Katie, there's also Celia, my best friend, who also knows about this. She may be a hothead, but when it comes to my secrets, I know her lips are sealed. Hey, Tessa, you have to see this. Celia waved her phone in my face. Hang on, that was BitKit Bakes, my all-time fave YouTube channel. I've been following this guy for ages. He was so talented. Oh, and he always wore this cute kitty mask. Look at his hands. They're so beautiful. And how I adore his warm voice. I bet he's really handsome, too. Celia is so smitten with boys. Ugh, it's Katie again. She's left her lipstick in the canteen, and I've got to fetch it for her and take it to some cafe in town. This is ridiculous. I'm sure she could survive without her stupid lipstick for one afternoon. I walked into the cafe and spotted Katie sitting with two boys. Hmm, wasn't that the boy from the cop station? Turns out he's called Max, and he's Katie's new boyfriend. And the other guy is Cody. Both of them are college students. Hey, Tessa, you should stay for cake. Seeing as I was here, I may as well have something sweet, right? So... I ignored Katie's eye rolls in my direction and joined them. The waiter brought some chocolate fudge cake over and... Yum, it sure looked good. I took a forkful of it and... Hmm, something wasn't quite right. This cake could use some salted caramel. Poof, a cake needs to keep its original flavor. If you add that to it, it'll be far too sweet. Oh, how rude. I was only voicing my opinion. Right at that moment, Celia phoned me. I just answered when she started screaming so loudly, and I had to hold my phone away from my ear. Tessa, Tessa, Tessa! Celia, is everything okay? I know how to impress the Big Kid Bakes guy. We must make him a DIY gift. A chocolate resin phone case. What do you think? Am I a genius or what? I noticed Max, Cody, and Katie all giving me strange looks. Jeez, this was so embarrassing. So I quickly hung up on Celia, then made my excuse to leave. Ugh. I liked it better when only I knew about BitKit Bakes. I watch his videos every day and daydream about baking with him. But now Celia's obsession over him was kind of tiring me out. She texted me nonstop to ramble about him and dragged me into her silly fan projects. She even joined this online fan club of his, and they all talked about how fit he looks, how handsome he must be. Hello, does anyone here really care about cooking? At least work meant I had a break from Celia's mithering. Ugh, what was he doing here? He bought two cups of coffee, then asked to borrow my phone because his was out of battery. I reluctantly handed over my precious phone, but then I heard a ringtone. Max excitedly took his ringing phone out of his pocket and said, So now I have your phone number, cute girl. What? The cheek of him. I'm his girlfriend's cousin. Has he no shame? I gave him a dumbfounded look, but he just smiled, handed back my phone, and winked at me. I saved my number in your phone. Give me a call. Then he left. He just reached the door when I snapped out of my daze. The phone case. Our chocolate phone case. Why did he have it? It's one of a kind, and we've already sent it to BitKid Bakes. Didn't we? I was about to run after him to clear this up when Katie appeared. Max, why did it take you so long to buy coffee? Then she stormed over to the counter as soon as she spotted me. Stay away from my boyfriend, or your secret goes parent public, okay? 
Katie glared at me and dragged Max away. Even though they were leaving, I could still hear her voice. Don't talk to that girl. I don't like her. Huh? What on earth? Who wants her boyfriend anyway? How irritating. One evening, I was lying on the couch and thinking about whether Max could really be Bitkit Bakes when Celia excitedly ran over. I have our mysterious idol's phone number! Oh no, here we go again. Celia was way too excitable sometimes. So, a secret source that's in the fandom sent it to me. I wonder if this is his real number. You really believe that's Bitkit's number? Let's just give it a try. We have nothing to lose! It would be a lie to say I wasn't any tiny bit curious. So, I entered the phone number, and as soon as I pressed the call, Max's name appeared on the screen. Huh? What's this? I quickly hung up and turned to tell Celia that it was just a fake number. If Max is really our idol, then I don't want Celia getting muddled up with my crazy cousin's love life. Celia just shrugged and said, It's okay, I'll find another way. Then she did that sticking tongue out concentration face of hers as she fiddled around on her phone. The next day, I got home from my shift, feeling a little worn out, but Celia still wouldn't give me a break. She came right over and dragged me out somewhere. Where are we going? I asked, but Celia just kept silent. Then we stopped in front of a small white house. At that point, Celia said, My source says this is Bitkit Bake's home! We're about to meet the most amazing guy ever! Before I could react, Celia ran to ring the doorbell. And as soon as the door opened, standing in front of us were Max and Katie. Tessa, why are you here? You know him? Uh, um, this is Max, Katie's boyfriend. We were on our way to a friend's party, but it seems like we have the wrong house. Sorry for bothering you. Then I hurriedly pulled Celia's hand to leave. But Max stopped us. Oh yeah? Then you must have come to the right house. We're having a party, so join us! I quickly waved my hand to refuse, but Celia immediately said, That would be great! And then ignoring Katie's death stares, pulled me inside. Hmm. So turns out Max lives here with Cody and this guy called Trevor. I'll find out which of these three boys is our idol. Wait for it. Celia made up some excuse about loving their decor and wanting to see the rest of it for inspiration. Trevor, who seemed to like her, jumped at the opportunity to show her around. Meanwhile, I wandered into the kitchen to try and solve the Bit Kit Bakes mystery myself. Max was in there making himself an egg sandwich, but oh my god, had he never touched a whisk before? He's so clumsy. I don't think there would be much of the egg left in the bowl after he's done whisking. The kitchen counter was full of food for the party, so I decided to give them a hand. Hmm, let's see. I spotted a bowl of cookie mixture, which looked like it could use some special ingredient, so I reached for the jar of sugar. And as expected, a hand stopped me. But, Cody? What are you doing? You use brown sugar for cookies, not white. You don't want to end up with a load of air pockets, do you? Yes, of course I knew that. And I also knew Bitkid had once said those exact words in one of his previous clips. So, the anonymous idol is... Cody? But Max's phone case was the one we sent to our idol. And the idol's phone number that Celia found was also Max's. This was so confusing, and I needed answers. So I asked Max to go outside with me. You aren't Bitkid Bakes, right? Why do you have that phone case? Oh, so you figured it out! Yeah. I know you sent it to Cody, so I intercepted it. I'm also the anonymous fan who gave Celia this address. It's fate, baby. You and me are meant to be together. Then he lunged towards me with outstretched arms. Oh my god, did he have tentacle arms or something? I couldn't escape from his grip. Then who should appear but, yep, Katie. She charged over, then pushed me, falling to the ground. Cody appeared and tried to stop the fight, but Katie's flailing arms knocked into him and caused his wrist to brush against the hot barbecue grill. I quickly went to check on Cody, but Katie just screamed out, I hate you! Then ran off with a shameless Max in hot pursuit. We then went to Cody's room to get the first aid box. Hang on, 
I recognize that mask. Don't worry, I'll keep your secret. But maybe this arm shouldn't be on screen for a while. Celia has, like, the best detective sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe a cute girl like you should wear the cat mask for the next few videos. What do you think? Are you sure? Your fans might speculate that the girl would have some kind of special relationship with you. Gosh, what am I saying? Wake up, Tessa! I should go. Right, there's something important waiting for me to handle at home. What a messy day! I couldn't carry on being under Katie's control any longer. I needed to confess all to my parents before she told them. Only, when I walked through the door, I heard these weird sounds coming from the living room. It was Katie bawling her eyes out on the couch. I ignored her and was about to go upstairs, but suddenly, she ran over to me and hugged me. Tessa, I'm so sorry for pushing you. I never meant for anyone to get hurt. I just really love Max, and it breaks my heart knowing he's such a womanizer. It's okay, but you seriously deserve way better than that jerk. So Katie and I made up, and she also promised that she wouldn't blab my secret to my parents. But I want to tell them the truth. I mean, I can't lie to them forever, right? And when they see how much baking means to me, they'll support me, right? Hey guys, so... I entered a baking contest and invited my parents along. And guess what? I won the best newcomer prize! Eek! Better still, my parents congratulated me and told me that if I loved baking this much, I should follow my dreams. Oh, and I did use the prize money from the contest to pay them back. Cody's been a massive help. He's given me some great tips and, actually, we've started dating. It's early days, but... Being with him makes me feel as happy as eating freshly made cookies. And as for Celia, well, she's still pretty convinced that Trevor's her idol. <laughs> One day I'll introduce her to the real BitKit Bakes. Soon. I can't believe it's been a year since Gerald passed away. I know it's been hard. But on the bright side, at least you still have your two wonderful daughters. Thank you. She smiled. Then she rubbed Jamie's head. I'm very proud of this one. Yeah, yeah. Jamie's pretty. Jamie's girly. Jamie's adorable. And I was just the other child. I watched on as the three of them relaxed on the porch, giggling about dumb stuff and enjoying their lemonade while I struggled with the stupid lawnmower. They didn't even notice me. I quickly finished up, then I grabbed my skateboard and hurried out of there. Charlotte, stop right there. And where exactly do you think you're going without my permission? Skateboarding. I grumbled, then left. Whatever. She didn't care anyway. She just wanted to suffocate me. It wasn't like this back when I had Dad on my side. As you can see, I'm not a girly girl. All that manicure and makeup stuff just seems like nonsense to me. But my non-identical twin, Jamie, lives for it. She always wakes up extra early just so she has more time to style her hair, apply her makeup, and pick out her daily outfit. Then all she does at school is sit around with the other Barbies and giggle at pretty much everything. But guess that's the kind of girl mom prefers, as it's blatantly clear that Jamie's her favorite. It's always me who had to do all the chores in the house, just so her Jamie could sit there scrolling through her phone. There was one time when I was washing the dishes, I heard a deafening shriek. No, my sister wasn't being murdered. Instead, there was a spider crawling across the floor. Poof! It was just a spider! Nuts! I didn't want to be a chore slave. I just wanted to skateboard. Yeah, skateboarding and painting are my true passions. But Mum told me skateboarding was for boys. Ugh, how ridiculous. So I often snuck out. There were times I got so into it that I lost track of time and arrived home to Mum's furious eyes. You're grounded. Next time, 
I won't hesitate in breaking your boards in half. Jeez, that was so unfair. I pushed past her and ran into my room. Then clutching my board, I burst into tears. I wish Dad was still here. <sighs> Whenever Mom and I argued, he always came up to my room and told me how Mom only acted the way she did because she cares about me. She just has a different way of showing it. It's been a whole year since he passed, all because of a freak accident at the factory he worked in. Now, we all had to rely on Mom's home tailor job, and I just became the errand girl, while Jamie sits around looking pretty? Worse still, Mom insisted I get a part-time job to support the family, while Jamie didn't have to. When I questioned Mom on this, she just said, Jamie isn't like you. She wouldn't be able to handle both school and work. Excuse me, what? But I knew arguing with mom about it was pointless. Anyways, it all worked out okay as I landed myself a job in this cool skateboard store. Oh, and also, less house chores. One rainy afternoon, the store was quiet, so I took out my sketchbook and designed some skateboards. Then my manager, Rick, peered over my shoulder. Uh-oh, was I in trouble? But to my surprise, he said, That's pretty good. Then he passed me a flyer for a skateboard designing contest. You should give it a try. This contest was meant to be, so I spent all my free time shut away in my room working on my design. I didn't see Mum or Jamie for a full week. How peaceful. <laughs> and guess what? I won first prize. It was awesome. However, Mum snatched the prize money from me due to family financial reasons. So my money was going to be used on new clothes and makeup for Jamie. Unbelievable! I didn't want to be under this roof anymore. But at 15, where else could I go? Poof. Then Mum told me her work was slow at the moment, so I should enter more contests to support my family. Hey, it got me out of chores, so I agreed to it and I pretty much won all of them. But it did annoy me that I didn't get to keep my rewards. Then when I saw Jamie showing off her new shoes, I just wanted to yank them off her feet and throw them at her. Ugh! I thought twins were meant to have some sort of deep connection or something. Not me and Jamie. We couldn't be more different. Finally, I had a day off, so I arranged to go skateboarding with Rick. I grabbed my board and was about to leave when Mom blocked the door. Charlotte, where do you think you're going? Jamie has a date tomorrow, and her dress needs hand washing. What? This was ridiculous. I rolled my eyes and said, in that case, she can wash it herself. Don't take that attitude with me, young lady. You'll do as you're told. Through angry sobs, I screamed at her. I wish you weren't my mom! Then I ran upstairs to my room. Right at that moment, the doorbell rang. My mom calmed down, cleared her throat, and opened the door. Huh? Why was there an expensive-looking car in our driveway? And why was a wealthy-looking couple standing on the doorstep? Curious, I hid behind the wall to see who they were and what they were here for. From my eavesdropping, I found out that the couple was the Barnes, they just retired from their jobs working for the government in the secret intelligence department. Mom and Mrs. Barnes were besties in high school, so when they both fell pregnant at the same time, Mom offered to bring their daughter up as her own so they could go and work away on their secret mission. We've both taken early retirement, and we can finally enjoy life. We're very grateful to both you and Gerald for looking after our daughter, but we're here to take her home now. Oh, my God! Turns out, one of us was adopted! No wonder we were nothing alike. But was it Jamie or me? Could it be me? I mean, Mom always preferred Jamie, so she could be her biological daughter. I knew they were my real parents. I could feel it. So taking a deep breath, I nervously stepped out to meet them. Jamie, come down here, sweetie. Mom called and I froze on the spot. I watched on as Jamie appeared, and Mum introduced her to her real parents. She didn't even seem surprised. She just replied, Yes, I know, then sweetly grinned. 
I'm so happy that I can finally meet you both. The Barnes cooed over Jamie like she was a puppy or something. Then they got emotional and all. Ugh, it made me want to puke. I ran up to my room, locked the door, and cried. Life was so unfair. Jamie was always the lucky one, while I always got the raw deal out of things. I must have cried myself to sleep, as when I woke up, it was morning. I reached for my phone. Jamie had messaged me. It's sad you missed my farewell dinner. I had a great time living with you. Come and hang out sometime, okay? Poof! I aggressively threw my phone down onto my bed. Bold of her to assume I would ever want to hang out with her. We had nothing in common. Luck alone was an example. Life went on, but without Jamie, as she moved to some rich kid's school. And I continued going to school, work, sneaking out to skateboard, and avoiding mom as much as possible. Then one chemistry class, while we were carrying out an experiment in the lab, one of my classmates made a mistake. And boom! We were all left looking like Cinderella! <laughs> And that might have actually been the best thing of that day, since we were dismissed two hours early. Excited, I rushed home to get my skateboard, but I knew I needed to sneak past mom so she didn't accuse me of skipping class. But as I passed the kitchen, I saw her sitting at the table sobbing to herself. What was going on? Suddenly, she stood up and walked out to the backyard. There was a leather notebook and a pen on the kitchen table so I tiptoed over and took a peek. It looked like her diary. Hmm, those freshly written lines were stained with tears. Jamie, my baby, I miss you terribly. I want you to live a wealthy, happy life. So I made the ultimate sacrifice. I tell myself every day that you're now a Barnes, not a Smith anymore, not my daughter anymore. What? I couldn't trust my own eyes. What did these words mean? Could it be... But even if she mistreats me sometimes, she couldn't be that kind of person, right? I tore out that page, then hurried off to the skate park. Only, I couldn't concentrate. It was so bad, I messed up my pop shivet and landed on my butt. Ugh, this was driving me insane. That evening, Mom appeared in my doorway and asked, Charlotte? What did you do this afternoon? I answered, I told you already. I was at school and then the skate park. Did you see my notebook? The leather one? I shook my head in response. Oh, it's my expense book. I can't remember where I left it. She gave another scan around my room before leaving. When she was out of sight, I immediately pulled out my phone and texted Jamie. Jamie, I miss you a lot. Can I come over to your house tomorrow? I needed to see Mr. and Mrs. Barnes. I had to find out what was going on once and for all. Jamie replied she had a date the next day. Hmm. While I was typing out a reply, she sent me another message. We can't hang out. Please stop contacting me. Okay, that was weird. Did she sense something was up? I checked Jamie's social network profile and noted down the name of her new school. The next morning, I skipped class, went straight to Jamie's school administrator's office to ask for the Barnes' address. Oh, and of course, I made up a convincing story. Jamie's my sister, but then we found out she's actually the Barnes' biological daughter. Now my mom, who raised Jamie all these years, is really sick, and I need to tell her, but I don't know how to reach her. Perfect. She handed me the address and even wished me luck. There was no point wasting time, so I skated my way round to the Barneses. As I rang on their doorbell, I could feel my heart somersaulting in my chest. I introduced myself as soon as they answered the door. Hey, I'm Charlotte, Mrs. Smith's daughter, but I strongly believe I'm not Charlotte Smith because I have something to show you. Then I handed them the torn page from my mom's diary. They both turned ghostly pale, and Mr. Barnes even had to grip onto the doorframe to steady himself. I felt bad for putting them through this. I mean, what if I was wrong? So I suggested, let's just do a DNA test to be sure. A few days later, the Barnes turned up at our house with Jamie. They slammed two DNA test results down in front of Mom. 
I peered down at them. Whoa! Turns out, I really am the Barnes's biological daughter after all! Mom gave this expressionless look, but then in a quiet voice she said, I just wanted Jamie to have a wealthy and privileged life. She's not as strong as Charlotte. She needs this more. Please don't blame her. She didn't know anything about this. Then she hugged Jamie and cried. Mr. and Mrs. Barnes looked overwhelmed. Finally, Mr. Barnes managed to find the words to say, Jamie's also like a daughter to us now. We will take care of her like you did with our daughter, but just stay away from us. He pulled Jamie away from Mum and guided her out of the house. Mrs. Barnes hugged me as she started crying. I found myself doing the same. This was my real mom holding me. Whoa, this was so crazy. I packed my things, but as I was leaving, my old mom called me back. Charlotte, I have something to give to you. Then she handed me a small box full of cash. This is your prize money. I put it away for your college fund. You better have it back. I'm so sorry. My sight blurred with tears. Dad was right. She still cared for me. My parents will forgive you. Then you'll soon see both of us again, I said as I hugged her tightly. Then I turned and left. A new life was waiting ahead of me. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one more to go, and two hundred thousand followers. <laughs> it looks like I'm making quite an impression on the world. Hey, you're looking at the hottest beauty and lifestyle influencer of Park Springs High School. Beauty and brains? I have both. <laughs> it's not surprising, is it? Obviously, a girl like me gets loads of attention. Oh, there are Nerdy Ben is, my number one fanboy. He's always following me around school and offering to help me with, well, everything. I can't blame him. I mean, I'm basically his queen. Hey, Ben. I didn't see you at my locker as usual. Are you good? I, I'm out of money today, so... Wait, Ben, don't say it like that. People will think I mugged you or something. I never ask for those groceries or sundries. Yes, you don't. Um, sorry. Okay, so that was weird. Then things got even stranger when I overheard Christine telling her friends that after being exposed, an anonymous IG singer's followers had skyrocketed to a whopping 500,000. But the thing was... She went to school here. She's that nobody in bio class, Stella. Stella hurried past me into class, followed by a flock of people trying to take her pick and asking her to sing. Blah, blah, blah. Some of the boys even offered to take her home after class. Oof, please. What were they thinking? Ugh. She could play the fragile and confused act on these losers, but she didn't fool me. The dropped book scenario was so overrated, but, huh? Why was Ben rushing to pick it up? What a traitor! Ben! Where's my homework? He couldn't even come up with a better excuse than, Um, I went out last night. This was baloney! I just heard him offer to help Stella with her homework. And guess what? This girl, still with her Little Miss shy facade up, told Ben that she could do her own essay. Ugh. Did she think she was Beyonce or what? Acting all high and thinking she's the beacon of the universe? I was furious. So she wanted a taste of fame, huh? Let's just say, as a senior in this field, having experienced its downside, it was time I taught her some manners. <laughs> After that, I made sure she became the main topic of every single talk in school. Hey, 
she needed to learn how this fame game worked. Everyone was giggling, pointing, and whispering behind her back. She had to cover herself with a hoodie that hid half of her face and walk through school in anxiety. Yeah, I know that paranoid feeling all too well when you obsess with why people keep on giving you odd looks. Then one day, I was putting my books back in my locker when I glimpsed someone running past me crying. It was Stella. And she dropped a note that said, If I were you, I wouldn't have shown up at school ever again. You're a joke. Gosh, do people even say these things? This was way too harsh. What happened? For God's sake. He didn't think I was the one who wrote this. Did he? From that day on, Ben completely ignored me. And worse, he was glued to Stella, comforting her as people talked behind her back. Ugh. Then one day, I was tying my shoelaces when I heard some cheerleaders trying to open someone's phone. Right at that moment, Stella stepped out of the shower stall. Upset to see others violating her privacy, she tried to fight back. But oh boy, this wallflower couldn't even make them budge. <sighs> Fine, I'll help her. But only this time. You tattletale! You think you run the place now just because you're popular? Go tell Ben I didn't put that note in your locker. Better yet, call him right now. Oh, come on. Just run to the bleachers and tell that nerd. Go! What are you looking at? I went over to the bleachers to find Ben comforting Stella. What now? Snitching on me again? Actually, Stella was just telling me that you didn't write that note. Could you be any more foolish? So, you're just gonna bluntly do whatever I tell you to? Don't mind her. It's just who she is. A bit rough, but a truly great friend. Uh, I don't make friends. Yeah, I'd learned it the hard way. Back in my early days on Instagram, the only friend I trusted posted a video of me changing in the school's shower stall. I still had my tea inside my shirt, but that taught me a cruel lesson about friendships and fame. When you're famous, people will always want something from you. You can't trust anyone at all. You hear me? Stella! Who's that? Liam, Stella's friend from the music club. They look good together, don't they? What? Are you jealous of him or something? For that silly chick? Ben didn't say anything, but just blankly stared at them. Huh? He never looked at me like that anymore. Now I was no longer the Instagram queen. That meant I was no longer his queen. <sighs> it was true there was no one I could trust. A few days later, there was a big football match. We were going up against our rival school for the final, and Stella was singing the national anthem. Even the mayor and a local TV station showed up for it. Crazy! Ben was part of the AV team, so when some dude told me Ben wanted to talk to me, I went to the AV room to find him. What did he want to talk about? Hopefully not something to do with Stella. Ugh. But as I got there, no one was around. Huh? Right at that moment, the screen showed Stella stepping up to the podium preparing to sing. But instead of the soothing melody, a string of strange, distorted sounds came out of her mic. What was going on? What are you doing here? Ashley! He pushed me aside and hurriedly fixed the sound system. And just a minute later, things were back to normal and Stella could restart the song. Ben gave me an accusing look, then dragged me behind the bleachers, where we met up with Stella and Liam. Then Ben told her I'd messed with her mic. Oof! How could he think I was capable of something like that? Meanwhile, this Liam guy stepped in, saying it could have been a technical error. Yeah, whatever. I went to leave, but Liam caught up with me. Weird. Weren't he and Stella having a thing? He immediately denied it, saying they were just acquaintances from music club. But you... 
I've been wanting to get closer to you for a while. You're the true Instagram queen. Not Stella. Whoa. This guy was a top-class jerk. Just a minute ago, he had his hands wrapped around Stella, and now he was trying to leech onto me. He even started leaning in to kiss me on the cheek. Quickly, I dodged it as I met Stella's gloomy look from behind. Yikes. It was time to get out of here. I didn't sleep so well. Ugh. All this stress was bad for my skin. So... I was groggily making my way along the school corridor when Stella stormed up to me. It was you, wasn't it? You were so mean to me, threatening to delete my IG account because you were so jealous Ben had left you for me. Now it's really gone, and it's all your fault. What are you talking about? I had nothing to do with your stupid account. Yeah, I gossiped about you to mess with you a bit, but that was all. And you? You think I did it too? Excuse me? Did he just ignore me? And there Ben was, my so-called friend who turned his back at me right at the moment I needed him the most. And I never threatened to delete her account. Why did she make it up? Was she that jealous of me and Liam yesterday? What's this? An unexpected message from Liam said, Hey Ashley, don't worry sweetie, I've got your back. What do you say we meet at 8 p.m. in the park? Ugh, this shameless, two-faced jerk. What was he up to this time? So after class, I slid a note into Stella's locker, pretending to be from Liam, saying, I have a surprise for you. See you at 8 p.m. in the park. I arrived on time to find Liam already waiting. He kept putting on this simping act like he was madly in love with me or something. I can help you prove everything, and I only ask for one tiny favor, that you'll be my girlfriend. You can do that? But how? Well, you can just simply put the blame on someone else. Let's say, Ben? Oh, honey, you don't have to do anything. Just come to me and let your man handle it. Ugh, this guy made me want to barf but I still had to play it cool so I could figure out what this dude had up his sleeves. Sounds interesting, but I want to know more. How are you going to carry out your master plan? Honey, I've already got all the pieces of evidence in my hands. <laughs> you mean? That's right. I was the one who deleted Stella's IG account, and I know a way to blame it on someone else. You did what? Ashley, I let my jealousy blind me. So when I saw him flirting with you right in front of me, I... I just lost it. At least you're not the only fool around here. He played both of us. And for the record, he's so not my type. <laughs> <laughs> Your type? Hmm, let me guess. Someone like... Ben? <laughs> He's such an idiot. He'd never realize I have feelings for him. But you're more of his type than I am. Besides, the way he just abandoned me when I needed him the most. Uh, Ashley, I didn't mean to hurt you like that. What? You've been there the entire time? Yeah, I've heard it all. Including the part about how you have feelings for me. Look, it's not what you think. I'm not into Stella that way. The thing is, I saw her singing at a coffee shop and realized right away she's my favorite anonymous singer on Instagram, so I sort of revealed her identity online. One thing led to another. I felt so guilty I just stayed by Stella's side and accidentally pushed you away. And it's not that I don't trust you. After you left, I tried to convince everyone you didn't do it, but they didn't believe me. Then Stella showed me the note in her locker of Liam asking her out. And I recognized your handwriting. I got worried, so... So... You didn't turn on me? Yeah. I know you can seem cold sometimes. But deep down, you have a good heart. So, turns out that Stella going viral meant some local lounge singer had lost a lot of gigs. 
so she hired Liam to delete Stella's account for good. This guy was no joke. The note, the cheerleaders, the mic accident. He was responsible for it all. Luckily for me, I'd managed to put my phone on record mode for the entire conversation I had with him. So the next day, I went ahead and reported him to the principal. Well, no bad deed goes unpunished. So I hope you enjoy your indefinite suspension, Liam. <laughs> As for me, I no longer go solo anymore as I have a new friend by my side, who now has quit social media and enjoys her passion for singing. And Ben is still Ben. Such a doofus. But my doofus. These need to be washed by hand. Kelly threw a pile of clothes on the floor. And be quick about it! Hey. I'm Maya, and that bossy girl is Kelly. Although we live in the same house, we aren't siblings. You see, when I was just a baby, I was adopted by a loving old couple. They lived on a farm in the countryside. Their kids had grown up and left home, and they were both missing the lively energy that only a child could bring. One Sunday at church, they saw the priest raising a baby girl and offered to help. So that's how they ended up taking me home and bringing me up as their grandchild. They were the nicest people, and they showered me in nothing but love and kindness. I'm always more than grateful for them. We lived together happily, until one day, when Grandpa was in the orchard, he collapsed. Sadly, he passed away. Grandma was never the same after that. She'd lost her soulmate. Her health also deteriorated, and then one night, she called me into her room. And gripping my hand, she said, Sweetie. You brought so much joy into our lives. Without us, life could be tough. But don't worry, we're always with you. When I'm gone, go find my old purse hidden in the broken tractor in the back barn. We've saved up a little bit for you. Our little Maya have to live your best life, all right? Then, before I could ask her any more about this, she closed her eyes, and just like that, She'd left me forever. I stayed with her for hours, crying my heart out. Afterward, following Grandma's words, I went in search of the money. Oh, God! I gasped in shock as I opened the purse. There was at least $20,000 here! How did my grandparents manage to save up such an amount of money? I knew they were thrifty, but this was way too much. After that... I moved to Columbus to live with my grandparents' daughter, Mrs. Madison, and her daughter, Kelly. So, you're wondering what I did with the money, right? Well, I keep it hidden here, in this crack in the roof. Oh, someone's coming. Your room is disgusting. Anyway, Kelly and I are going out, so make sure you clean everywhere before we get back. I expect it to be spotless. I gave a weak nod and watched her totter away. This wasn't a new occurrence. Every day, they'd mess up the house, then force me to clean it. I know, I was basically the real-life Cinderella. But it's okay. As soon as I turned 18, I'm gonna leave this place anyway and start living my own life with my money. The next morning, it was raining, so I tried to walk to school as fast as possible when suddenly, Kelly drove past me and deliberately sped through this big puddle. Mud splattered all over me. Jeez, why is torturing me her favorite hobby? My shirt was filthy, and as I walked toward my locker, some girls laughed at me. One even sneered. The dirty look must be trendy in the countryside, but here it just looks tragic. Yeah, I've been in the city for almost a year now, but I still couldn't fit in. Maybe it's because I always wear the same worn-out clothes and borrow all my books from the library. Mrs. Madison refused to buy me anything new, and I couldn't use my own money, as that would look suspicious. I couldn't even afford to go on the school picnic. <sighs> I'd never be one of them. Then, during recess, the class monitor Josie informed everyone that prom was happening soon, and the dress code was formal. While all the other kids squealed and clapped excitedly, I lowered my head and sighed. I had nothing to wear to prom. 
Maya? Hearing my name broke me from my thoughts, and I realized it was Josie, and standing around her were some of the nice girls from class. You have to come to prom this time, please? You've never joined us in any other activities before. Don't worry, we will help you look spectacular. I gave an awkward smile and replied, Thanks, guys, but I can't expect you to do that. They all insisted that I should go, but I remained adamant that it wasn't my kind of thing. Then came Meanie Kelly. Maya isn't suitable for this type of event. How dare she say that? I mean, just because I wasn't a spoiled princess didn't mean I wasn't suitable to attend. So I turned to Josie and smiled. Actually, that sounds fun. I will go to the prom. That evening at dinner, I mentioned the prom to Mrs. Madison and suggested that it could be a reward in exchange for doing all the housework. She coldly replied, You live under my roof rent-free, and now you expect me to do housework for you too? Or what, your majesty? Then she turned to Kelly, smiled and asked, Darling, have you decided on a prom dress yet? Then Kelly showed her mom pictures of gorgeous dresses on her phone while throwing smirks at me. Ugh! I couldn't sit around looking at Kelly's smug face anymore. This time, I definitely had to go to prom and be prettier than her. So that weekend, I went thrift store shopping with Josie. And after looking in about a dozen stores, Josie lifted up this really pretty blue gown. It had a tear down the side, but I knew I could easily sew that up and thrift flip it a little. I'd seen people do that on YouTube. The night of the prom, Josie did my hair and makeup, and I showed up in the dress. I felt like a real-life princess, and everyone was looking at me and giving me compliments, while Kelly stood there with her arms folded and a sulky look on her face. And then this boy called David walked over to me and started talking. Turns out, he was the new senior here. All the girls had their eyes on him, including Kelly, who walked over and tried offering him a drink, but he snubbed her and continued talking to me, leaving her standing there in silent anger before storming out of the prom. I had such a wonderful night with my new friends. I arrived home in a great mood and was happily singing to myself, but this instantly changed when I saw Kelly sitting there waiting for me. Such a thief! Now, don't tell me this fancy dress just fell down on you from the sky! Kelly shouted at me. I insisted that I hadn't stolen anything, so she dragged Mrs. Madison to the living room and asked her to check if she had lost any money recently. Mrs. Madison said no without thinking at first, but when she read Kelly's face, she started to fake complaining about some hundred-dollar bills missing from her purse, and the two started to jump on me. Ugh! Unbelievable! I ran up to my room and tried to shake away the negative thoughts and think back to how happy I was at prom. Then, as usual, I checked my hiding spot. Huh? What was that noise? I looked towards the stairs, but no one was there. Hmm. It was probably just the house creaking or something. The next day at school was amazing, as loads of kids stopped and talked to me. Then, when I got home, I went up to my room and double-checked my hiding spot. My heart plummeted in my chest. The purse! It had gone! I frantically searched for it. Then I remembered hearing something last night, and there were only three of us in this house. Could it be? Furious, I ran into the living room where Mrs. Madison and Kelly were watching TV. I shouted at them. My money! I want it back right now! In an unconcerned tone, Mrs. Madison replied, What money? What are you talking about? Oh, I see. So you have your own money all along, and have been keeping it for yourself? Puff, what an ungrateful brat. Mom lets you live here even though you aren't actually family, and now you're accusing us of stealing? I knew they'd taken my money, but what could I do about it? I had no choice but to go back to my room and cried as I looked at old photos of me with my grandparents. The next day at school, I really wasn't in the mood for lessons. During recess, I was just staring out of the window in despair when I heard a cough. So I looked and saw David there. Hey, Maya. He smiled at me. 
Are you okay? You seem kind of down. I'm fine. I gathered up my stuff and left. I know he was only being nice, but I wasn't feeling like small talking right now. Then, after school, Kelly made me carry her heavy backpack home. I had no energy left to argue, so I glumly did as she asked. That's when David drove up alongside me and asked, Hey, that looks heavy. Do you need a lift? I nodded and got into his car while forcing a smile to thank him. He asked, Maya, what's up? You can talk to me, you know. I'm a good listener. Promise. He's so sweet, and I instantly felt safe around him. We chatted a lot and started hanging out more and more after that. We took walks through the park and had lunch together. I found myself growing closer to him, but not in the way you might think. No, more like a brother. Then, a few weeks later, when Mrs. Madison made me clean up the mess in the house that she'd made again, I found something under her bed. The old purse that Grandma had left me. And the money was all gone! I stormed downstairs and slammed the purse onto the kitchen table. But Mrs. Madison shrugged. It was my mother's purse. Therefore, that money belongs to me. You obviously stole it from my poor elderly parents. Kelly backed up her mom with her annoying tone. Wow, how low do you have to be to con a sick old lady into giving you her life savings? Grandma left it for me, not you. You two are monsters. I screamed at them, took the purse, and went up to my room. I started to pack. Then I was leaving here once and for all. Only, when I went to try the door, I couldn't open it. Oh. M.G. They'd locked me in! Worse still, in all the drama, I'd left my phone downstairs, so I couldn't even call David for help. The next day, Mrs. Madison let me out, but only on the condition that I did all the housework, and from now on, I wasn't allowed to go to school or anything like that. And if I broke this rule, she'd make sure I ended up in trouble for stealing the money. So, it is what it is. I had no choice. They've caught me on a string. One afternoon, I was out front watering the flowers when Mrs. Madison shouted out from the living room. No, not the roses. Water the ones over there. You useless girl. Then suddenly, I felt someone yank my arm. It's David. He was worried about my absence, so he came to check on me. Maya, there's someone I want you to meet. Then he signaled me to follow him. I had no idea where David was taking me, but anything would be a way better option than listening to any more of Mrs. Harrison's nagging, so I got in his car. He took me to his house, and there was this man in there. I suppose it's David's dad, but then, with tear-filled eyes, the man blurted out, Maya, it's you, my daughter. You're finally home. Huh? What? So... After I sat down and had a sip of water to brace myself for whatever was about to come, the two told me about how when I was a baby, my mom got sick and passed away. My dad struggled to look after me and my brother, so he gave me to a priest. Eventually, my dad managed to turn his life around, and knowing that I'd been adopted by the elderly couple, he started sending money to them to help them raise me. Then, when he came to find me, I wasn't there anymore. He found out that I was living with the daughter of an elderly couple in Columbus. So he moved to this city with the hope of finding me. It was such a coincidence that David ended up attending the same school as me. David said that the first time he saw me, he felt this strange bond right away. And how amazing that this gut feeling was right. As it soon became clear, I was his long-lost sister. Wow, this was a lot to take in but it was the greatest news ever. I left Mrs. Madison's house after that, of course, and moved in with my dad and brother. And for the first time since I'd lost my grandparents, I found myself feeling truly happy again. Now, you're probably wondering what became of Mrs. Madison and Kelly. Well, I was walking past their house the other day and saw a for sale sign in the yard. Turns out, Mrs. Madison had been spending money like water, and now was in debt, so she was having to sell the house. I don't want to gloat or anything, but 
I guess that's karma for them. Holy baloney! Who is that? This guy was next level hot! And there's more. As I neared him, he didn't run off looking afraid! Seeing me dumbfoundedly gasping, Scarlet elbowed me. Wake up, chicka! We're late! She giggled as she dragged me to class. I saw it. Never thought I'd see the day that Margot the Troublemaker would go all gooey-eyed over some boy. <laughs> Scarlet teased me. I blushed and was completely tongue-tied, eyes looking around awkwardly. It's a shame you're basically a walking, talking boy repellent. Yeah, right. I lowered my head to think, and when I looked up, Scarlet was texting, probably some cringe overload message to her boyfriend, Keith. I rested my chin on my hands and stared out of the window as I found myself daydreaming about that cute mystery guy. What time do you call this? Are you trying to get me kicked out of this place for covering for you again? Um, so's. I had something super important to do with Alfie. Important, huh? So I could end up in trouble for covering your butt? Because you want to pull some lame prank with that loser? Uh-uh. How many times do I have to tell you? We only pranked him once, and that jerk totally deserved it. About that jerk? He's the captain of the basketball team, and Alfie's my friend. Okay, he might look a bit intimidating, but he's a nice guy. But that jock not only knocked Alfie out with his basketball, he also took his money out of his pocket when he was down. We weren't going to let him get away with this. So that night, we snuck out and poured greasy cooking oil all over the field, which made the whole team slip and fall again and again. It was hilarious. Unfortunately, word of our involvement reached the principal, so Scarlet had to call her dad to help me. Okay, so this wasn't exactly the first time Scarlet had saved me. She only got mad as she had to save Alfie's butt too, even though she hates him. <laughs> Come on, I'm sorry. Would you mind? It's midnight and we need to sleep. Shut up, Miley. No one asked you. Fine, go to bed and shut up so we can actually get some sleep. Oof. Those girly girls. Wake up, princess. The class is over. I groggily got up and followed Scarlet like a zombie to the cafeteria. But then I came to an abrupt halt. There, standing on the corner of the hallway, was that handsome guy. What on earth is going on? I've asked Keith to do some research. Now, do you want my help or not? I still froze and couldn't say anything. OMG. I'd never felt so nervous like this before. I nodded while holding her arm. <laughs> wow. So all it took for the mighty Margot to turn into a timid wreck was some dude? Oh, and by the way, he's called Jared, and he's studying classical music. Very elegant. Huh? I blurted out. Classical music? This sucks! I mean, how's a girl like me ever gonna reach his level? Don't worry. I'll help you. Then she changed her attitude. On one condition. Hmm. <laughs> you know what? Scarlet demanded me to stop hanging out with Elfie, because it was not good for the girly image I needed to get Jared's attention. Plus, I wouldn't be allowed to pass the dorm's curfew. If I broke these conditions, then she wouldn't help me anymore. Fine. I agree. Sorry, Elfie. You'll just have to carry on without me. Keith befriended Jared and asked him to come over to our school again to check on those pianos in the music room. When there's an oops emergency, he will leave Jared with me, who it turns out is struggling with the piano. Genius! As you can see, this plan is going well so far. Just this dress was really suffocating me. Ugh, but being around Jared seemed to suffocate me even more. Luckily, he was quite friendly, so we started talking easily and now he's playing for me. Do you have any plans after school? No, not yet. I'm about to go to this music cafe in town. Would you like to join me? OMG! Of course I said yes! Does this count as a first date? 
We actually had a lot of fun. I was in seventh heaven. On our way back, I was startled when I saw Elfie across the street. Noticing me with Jared, Elfie glared at me with this maddened, wide-eyed look. I gave him the shush sign and looked away. No surprises. My phone beeped. You blew me off to hang out with that sissy boy? And what's with your clothes? Jeez, Elfie was angry for sure, but I couldn't do this right now. I'd promised Scarlet I wouldn't talk to him anymore. So I ignored the message and walked straight past him. As soon as I arrived back at the dorm, the girls cooed around and asked me about the date. They seemed so happy for me. So, when's the next date? He asked me to come over to his school tomorrow, and then we're going to have dinner. Ah! The girls screamed in unison. Surprising, as I didn't think these grumpy girls cared this much about me. I was so excited about the date, so I arrived early at Jared's school to find him practicing with another girl. I walked into the room with a smile on my face, and Jared introduced me to her, Maeve. Then he told me to wait there and left to go to the bathroom. This Maeve girl sniggered, then looked me up and down and said, Give it up. An unrefined girl like you doesn't deserve him. Huh? What on earth did I ever do to her? Angry, I knocked over her music sheets. She picked it up, then sternly said, Just you wait. I won't let you get away with it. Then she shoved past me and stormed off. Then, at dinner, I couldn't help it. So, that Maeve? Ah, our parents are very close, so we've been friends since we were little, and now we both study music. She seems really into you. I'm not so sure about that. We're just friends. So he doesn't like that Maeve girl? I guess. Just forget about her. I have a very important date with Jared, and I need your help. Right at that moment, a call from Alfie arrived. But Scarlet was sitting right next to me, so I couldn't pick up. After a few calls, he texted me. You gotta help me this time. I can't do it by myself. Oh, God help me. I didn't have the heart to abandon my friend. So, I decided to sneak out and go see Alfie. Okay, so it's not what you think. Those times I was late weren't because we were up to no good. We've been fixing up this abandoned house for these homeless kids instead. This time, one of those kids, Kevin, had a serious fever. I had to help Alfie borrow some money and take Kevin to the hospital. I tried to be deadly quiet as I crept into the dorm room. But I swear, Scarlet is the lightest sleeper in existence. And sure enough, she was there waiting for me. Oh, hi, Margo. It's nice of you to join us. Yeah, sorry. It was, um, an emergency. You just can't help yourself, can you? You broke our agreement to go hang out with that thug friend of yours. I'm not helping you ever again. <sighs> this sucked. It looked like I was on my own. This is it. My big date with Jared. His dad's the conductor here. And from what I can gather, that's a massive deal. Without Scarlet to help me find the right dress for this event was a nightmare. Oh man, everyone looked so luxurious and classy. I felt like a sore thumb. This obviously wasn't the world I belonged to. But Jared's gentle smile soothed me down a lot. But soon, Maeve was coming towards us. Ugh. Jared, darling, congrats! I think this concert will be amazing. Oh, it's you again. Nice dress. Ugh! She was really pulling on my leg. But stay calm. Now breathe. Breathe. Then they both talked about Mozart, Beethoven. I didn't understand a thing. As well as the whole concert, I didn't understand either. Afterward, Jared led me over to his parents. OMG, this was scary. I gave them the bouquet of flowers I've prepared and congratulated them on the concert. Luckily, they both seemed really friendly and were really content with my gift. But then Maeve appeared and hugged Jared's mom. Jared, it's lovely to be around such polite girls. Smirking, Maeve replied, I wouldn't be so sure about that. Margo here likes hiding her true personality. Okay, so I may have failed to keep my cool and blurted out some bad words. Oops. Jared and his parents looked shocked by this. But before I could try and rectify the situation, Maeve pulled out her phone and waved around a photo of me with Alfie. I wanted to explain, 
but I just ended up stuttering out a load of nonsense. In the end, Jared pulled me aside and told me, I think it's best if you just leave. I ran out of there close to tears. Worse still, I couldn't run in this dumb dress. I'd lost Jared, and it was past curfew. So if I went back now, Scarlet would get mad at me. So I decided that I wasn't going to go back. Nope. Instead, I was going to run away. I'd been staying here for a couple of days. I feel safe here, and Alfie bought me some clothes and food. Ugh, why is she here? I wasn't in the mood for a lecture. But to my surprise, she rushed over to me and wrapped her arms around me. How could you just leave me like that? Have you any idea how worried I've been? Anyway, Alfie told me everything. I'm sorry for misjudging you. She pulled away. You do stink, though. <laughs> There's one more person who wants to see you, Margot. I looked at him with confusion. Then at the door, it was Jared. Margot, when I saw that photo, I was shocked. I thought it must be some joke to you, and you were really with Alfie. But then I couldn't stop thinking about you. Now I've spoken to Scarlet and Alfie. I know better. I like you, Margot. The real you. And I don't want you to think you have to change for me. Do you think you can give this idiot another chance? I hesitated, pretending that it was something I had to think about. Then smirking, I shouted out, yes, and rushed into his arms. So, what now? Well, I'm back in the dorm, and, yep, I still sneak out, and, yep, Scarlet still covers for me. <laughs> Jared and I are an official couple and he's even helping me with a fundraiser concert to help out the homeless kids. So, I guess that this tough girl is actually not so tough after all. <laughs> hey kid, why are you here alone? What's your name? I first noticed this little girl when I discovered this epic pastry shop near my school. She'd always be sitting in the alleyway nearby, wearing the same clothes over and over again, clutching a teddy bear in her arms. She looked up at me with her big, innocent eyes and answered timidly, I... I'm Alex. Then she started crying quietly and said, My mom and dad are always working, so I wait for them here. Sometimes they're gone for days. Oh, this poor little girl. She must have been starving as she kept eyeing my bag of croissants. I gave her one, and she said chocolate croissants were her favorite. Wow, just like me. No wonder I'd felt drawn to this little girl. She ate it so fast, and I told her I'd go buy her another one, and I'd be right back. I couldn't bear to see her so hungry. How could her parents just leave her like that? I ran as fast as I could. But when I got back to the alleyway, she was gone. How weird. I couldn't see her anywhere. I walked home, and that night, I couldn't stop thinking about her. Had her parents come to pick her up? The next day, I went back to the pastry shop, and before I even got there, I heard some kids shouting. I tried to take a closer look, and there Alex was, huddled on the ground while the kids threw her teddy bear around. Oh no. She was crying. This made me so angry, so I charged towards them. Hey, leave her alone right now, or you'll have me to deal with. The bullies immediately ran off. I rushed over and put my arm around Alex. She wiped tears from her eyes and said, Thank you. Other than my teddy, you're the only one who wants to be my friend. I swear the lump in my throat couldn't get any bigger. Then I asked her what happened. She told me how she skipped school because she was bullied for wearing old, smelly clothes. Even the teachers were mean to her, she said. Oh gosh, my heart. I couldn't bear this, so I held out my hand. Alex, I can't leave you out here like this. I've always wanted a little sister. So what do you say? I promise I'll protect you. Alex squeezed my hand, which I took as a yes, and then we got up, and she asked if she could show me something. It was a playground that she used to go to, and as soon as I saw it, 
I felt something well up inside me. It looked so familiar. We played on the jungle gym and the swings, and they even had a big slide that was so fun to play on. We played for hours, and it felt like I'd gone back in time to my childhood. Well, if only I could actually remember my childhood. As far as I know, when I was just eight years old, I had a big accident. It gave me a major head injury and wiped my memory completely. Ever since then, I've been going to therapy and taking medication. But it's so weird not being able to remember anything from before. I try to focus on the present, though, and I know I'm lucky to even be alive. However, sometimes the migraines from the accident get really bad, and that's exactly what happened when we were on the swings. One minute, I was looking at the clouds and laughing. The next, I felt myself slipping off the swing and landing on the ground. The last thing I saw was Alex running towards me. When I opened my eyes, I was in a hospital bed, and my parents were there holding my hands. Recently, my migraines had been getting more frequent, and it really worried my mom and dad. My first thought was, where's Alex? I asked my parents if they'd seen an eight-year-old girl, but they looked confused. I realized she'd probably been scared and run off. She was constantly on my mind, though, so as soon as I got out of the hospital a few days later, I went to find her again. She was nowhere to be seen. But there was a fire in my heart that kept urging me to find her, so I couldn't give up. I had to find her. I ran to the playground and was relieved to see her on the swings. She looked so sad, so I asked her what was up, and she burst into tears and she said, My family, they lost everything. A gang came to our house and stole everything we own. Even I started crying after hearing that. How could people be so cruel? She then told me she hadn't eaten for days, as her parents now had no money to buy her food. Luckily, I had just bought some chocolate croissants, and she gobbled them both. Meanwhile, my mind was cluttered with thoughts of helping Alex. My savings were barely enough to support her, but maybe my parents could help? They donated to a church in town, so I'm sure they'd be happy to help Alex. I quickly called my mom, and she said she'd love to meet Alex and see what they could do. So I happily told Alex the good news, and we walked straight to my house. I gave her some more food, and we sat on the couch to wait for my parents. Seeing her bright face made me feel so happy. As soon as I heard their car pull up, I ran to the door and said, Mom, Dad, Alex is here. My parents came in and looked around the room. Then my dad said, Um, sweetie, where is she? I pointed to the sofa and said, She was just there. Then I called her name but she didn't reply. I didn't get it. Where was she? My mom looked worried and said, Is she too shy? Are you sure she was with you, honey? I frantically checked the whole house, but she was nowhere to be found. I was starting to panic now, but my dad held me and said, Alice, sweetie, calm down. Maybe you just need a rest. Then I heard my mom whispering to him, the severe migraines probably have drained her out again. Get her upstairs. I'll call the doctor to ask about hallucinations. I'm not hallucinating! She's real! Why don't you believe me? I screamed out while trying to break away from my dad's arms. I was feeling dizzy by this point. My head was pounding, and the next moment, everything went dark again. I ended up in hospital again for the second time that week. Wow, that was a new record. I was lying there pretending to still be unconscious to eavesdrop on my parents chatting to the doctor. Alice has been acting a little strange. She keeps mentioning a homeless girl, and it sounds quite similar to her childhood. Today, she even said she brought her home to meet us, but we can't find her anywhere. And I don't think she even exists, my mom said. The doctor then said, it's possible that this little girl is actually Alice's lost memories. Sometimes after therapy and medication, old memories can start resurfacing. Maybe this little girl was someone from Alice's childhood. A friend or something. What? This was crazy. Was Alex from my childhood? I didn't understand. 
I sat bolt upright and stuttered, Are, are you hiding something from me? I could tell right away they were, because my parents looked panicked, and my mom said, Listen, sweetie, it's been a long day for you. Now isn't the right time for this story. But I'll tell you tomorrow, okay? The next day, my parents drove me to the church that they donate to every year. I was so confused and kept asking them who Alex was. Eventually, a nun appeared, and we all sat down in a little room on the third floor. Then the secrets came pouring out. My parents weren't my real parents. After I had the accident, my parents adopted me from the church. They'd picked me up at the hospital right after I recovered and didn't tell me what happened because they didn't want to make my life any harder. They just wanted me to be happy. I couldn't believe it. Then the nun asked me to explain what had been happening recently, and I told her about Alex. As soon as I said her name, the nun looked shocked and quickly pulled out a photo album. She showed me a photo of two twin girls and said, This is you, Alice, holding the teddy bear. And next to you is your twin sister. Her name is Alex. Suddenly, the room was spinning. This was all too much. I had a twin sister? Before I even had time to ask anything, the nun took my hand and led me over to a big window near the stairs. Through her words, all the past memories came rushing back to me. My biological parents had brought me and Alex to the church because they couldn't afford to raise us. No families wanted to adopt both of us, so the nun told us we would be separated. This was the most painful news we'd ever heard. So that night, we decided to escape together. I gave Alex my teddy bear to hold so that I could climb out the window first. But unfortunately, I slipped and fell from such a height that I'm lucky I even survived. That's what wiped all my memories. I stared at the window as the nun told me all of this. This was insane! How many secrets had been hidden from me all this time? So, where is Alex now? I asked, tears rolling down my cheeks. Turns out, Alex had been adopted by another family, but the nuns had lost contact with her because the family had moved overseas. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I had to see my sister. But how could I find her without any information? I started to search social media like crazy, but nothing came up. I wouldn't give up hope, though. I updated my journey finding Alex every day on a personal blog. Not one night I went to sleep without thinking about her and wondering how she was doing. Fortunately, people on the internet actually showed a lot of interest and support for my story. It got passed around, but so far, there still wasn't any hint about Alex. Even the illusion of baby Alex wouldn't show up anymore, ever since the day I heard the truth. But I knew in my bones that we would find our way back to each other again somehow. And then, one morning, I woke up from a strange dream with another migraine. So I decided to take a walk and get some fresh air, and drop by the pastry shop for breakfast. I glanced over to the alley as usual, and I saw myself pacing around with a teddy bear in hand looking kind of lost. Sounds like I'd lost the plot, right? Well, I hadn't, because it actually was Alex. We were frozen for like a whole minute when our eyes met. Then, without a single word being said, we just ran into each other's arms in tears. So, long story short, Alex had moved to France since 10, and ever since then, she'd also been trying to find me. Thanks to a post on Twitter, she realized I was still here, and so she applied for a scholarship to America so she could find me. And, well, there she was, standing right in front of me. Words can't express how unreal it still was to look at her every time. Oh, don't worry. Everyone, including my parents, have confirmed she's an actual person. Not another product of my imagination. <laughs> Thank God. I can't believe the crazy roller coaster ride that my life has been on for the past months. From that moment on, we were inseparable. And now, we're planning on moving in together. The only thing left for us to do is to find our biological parents. Alex remembers them clearly, 
so she's been filling me in on the first eight years of our life together. Wish us luck! Bella here. I'm 23 years old, and I have big dreams of becoming a talent architect. I was born in a pretty normal family. Don't get me wrong, I adore my family a lot, but they don't understand my deep passion. I didn't want to stay in my dreamy childhood town and have some ordinary job. I wanted to design amazing houses and eco-friendly hotels. I studied super hard on my degree, and it all worked out as this major architect company called the Starcross Estate Company offered me a job. And better still, it meant I got to continue staying in sunny California. OMG, talk about amazing. Well, at least I thought it was down to my hard work and talents. You see, my boyfriend Ed also works for the Starcross Estate. I met Ed at a college party a few years ago. At that time, I was still a student and he was an alumnus. We bonded over our love of modern architecture and ecological buildings. It took over a year for me to build up the courage to confess my feelings to him. We were at this cafe near college, and I was so nervous when I mumbled it out. Luckily, he figured out what I was trying to say, so he held my hand, then said, Yes, Bella, I'm such an amateur when it comes to matters of the heart, but I feel the same about you. I fell madly in love with him, and being around Ed, well... It was when I was at my happiest. Then, after my graduation ceremony, I mentioned how I wanted to find a job nearby so I could stay in Cali and be close to him. He said there was a position going at his workplace, and if I gave him a copy of my CV, he'd pass it on. He often told me that he could hook me up with a job there when I graduated, but I just thought he was joking. I mean, he was just some intern, right? It was not like he could help me to get a job at a large company like the Starcross Estate. Anyway, I still gave it to him to find a chance. Then a week later, I got called in for an interview. Then later that day, they called me back saying I got the job. I almost screamed when I was running to tell him in excitement, but he just smiled and said, You didn't trust me back then, did you? Congrats, my new colleague. I was over the moon and couldn't wait to start my next chapter. On my first day, I was super nervous, but Ed said I could go in with him. As we walked in, the receptionist looked at Ed and said, Morning, Mr. Stratford. Your father would like to talk to you in his office. What? I stared at him open-mouthed. He quickly explained to me how he was not only the head of the project management department, but his father owned the company. I'd been dating him for over a year, and he never thought fit to tell me this. It was true that he didn't need to tell me about his family, but this fact was too overwhelming. I had a job in the design department of a prestigious architecture company. And yes, I was the boss's son's girlfriend. This made me kind of awkward. I'd always believed that I could get this job because the company saw my ability, not because the one who introduced me was the heir. But soon, I surely would show that I deserved to be there, regardless of who I was dating. But everything was not that easy. Word soon got around the office that I was Ed's girlfriend and I was constantly getting dirty looks from other people. Once, I was in the toilet cubicle and overheard some girls talking about me. One girl said, Talk about favoritism. The new girl in the design department didn't even experience one day as a trainee. 
Then another girl said, That bumpkin wouldn't survive for long. Maybe she only lasts a week. Wanna bet? Of course no. Who will we bet with when we're on the same side? <laughs> so, hello from the other side. I just couldn't hold it and walked out to see who was badmouthing me. And I saw that one of the girls was Diane, who worked in the sales department. What made it worse was she'd always been super nice to me up until this point. I could see their funny faces when they saw me there. Don't act like that. You are still good girls, not talking behind my back, but my front, I said, then left them frozen inside. I thought that would be the end of it, but it turns out it was just the beginning. Since that day, Diane sneered and made nasty comments whenever I passed her, such as, Yuck, have you seen the state of her shoes? And, someone should tell her frizzy hair is not a trend. I tried my best to ignore her, but then one time, I got a really strange email from a customer telling me how she was conflicted if she should go with my design or not, after what my colleague told her about me. It turns out, Diane had told this customer that I was an immoral person who stole other people's designs and tried passing them off as my own. Saying snide comments about me was one thing, but badmouthing my work? Now, that was a step too far. I waited until Diane came out of her meeting, then I pulled her aside and said, Look, you can't go around saying I steal other designers' work and use them as my own. I've worked hard to get here, and saying stuff like that is not fair. She snorted. Yeah, right. You're only here because you went crying to your boyfriend for a job. I'm here because I'm good at what I do. <laughs> Whatever. You're not good enough, and he'll see that eventually and choose me instead. What? Suddenly, this all made sense. She was being a mean girl because she had a crush on my boyfriend, and she was jealous he was with me, not her. So I kept my cool when I said to her, If your problem is Ed, and you think you're good enough to deserve him instead of me, you should focus on him only. Don't change your arrow direction to me and my work. You'll get nothing. Diane seemed really mad. So, okay, the one who should get mad was me, not her. Luckily for me, my boss Jim wasn't like Diane. Instead, he was a really nice guy who didn't treat me differently just because of who my boyfriend was. One time, I was snooping through his profile, purely for project purposes, and I discovered he went to the same college as me, just at different times. I mentioned this to him, and he smiled and said, Yeah, that's where I met your boyfriend. He's a good friend of mine. Oh, I hated the word boyfriend at work, so I just ignored it and changed the subject. But anyway... It was good news, right? Jim was Ed's best friend, so at least I could trust him and learn from his work experience. Since I'd worked at Starcross Estate, I often had lunch with Ed, Jim, and Ellie. Ellie was Ed's half-sister, and also his assistant. She was really sweet and ridiculously beautiful. The way she talked and acted made me overwhelmed. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that she was such the cleverest and gentlest girl I'd ever met. Gradually, I spent more time after work with Ed, Jim, and Ellie. We usually spent all dinner time discussing work. To me, three of them were the colleagues that I always wanted to work with. But, except business things, I didn't know a lot about Jim and Ellie's personal life. Ellie was sweet and all, but she was also a kind of private person and somehow distant from others. Except for Ed, of course. And about Jim, he even had never been close to me and only seemed to talk about work stuff. They were both close to Ed, so I wanted to make friends, but, well, maybe they just saw me as their colleague. As for work, yeah, that was going pretty great. But then in true mean girl fashion, Diane struck again. One day, she stormed over to my desk, slammed a folder full of my designs down onto it, and started yelling at me, You've not followed the customer's requirements, and they're not happy. I replied, Oh, I'm sorry. I'll fix it right away. It's not good enough? You're clearly not good enough to be here. Your work's sloppy, and you don't listen. I forced a smile back and said, Okay, I'll fix it. She didn't let me finish my words, but just rudely walked away while all of my colleagues were looking at me suspiciously. This whole incident made me feel super deflated. I didn't understand it. I reread the design requirements through and had never seen those orders. Hadn't I? I tried to forget about it all and enjoy my evening, as I was out for dinner with Ed, Jim, and Ellie. We were just quietly enjoying the meal as usual when Ed and Ellie had unexpected work pop up and had to leave. Jim gave me a lift home, 
and I thought it would be a super awkward and silent journey. But then he asked me if I was okay about what Diane had done to me. I didn't expect him to care about my problem. I always thought that Jim was a stone cold who cared about nothing but work. But turned out, he was so delicate and caring. Then he continued, As a head of my department, I'm sorry that I can't step in to defend you if the problem isn't big enough. Because, you know, it can make the situation worse. And you might suffer more from everyone's gossip. I understand, I honestly said. I think you're a very talented designer, and Ed's girlfriend or not, there's no doubt that you're the best person for the job. If I was you, I'd carry on doing what you're doing and show them all how deserving you are to be there. Jim smiled and patted my shoulder when he said that. I really appreciated Jim's words. I knew he was a nice guy, but he seemed so work-focused and could come off kind of cold, so it was good to see another side to him. I took his advice, and I put all my motivation into creating the best work possible. I read through all the job requirements I was sent at least three times and jotted down notes so no one could catch me out again. And I often spent my breaks in the office learning more about the company or discussing architecture with Jim. I was finally beginning to feel like I belonged there and that my colleagues were beginning to believe this too. Little did I know, another storm was waiting for me. That day, when I was about to leave work, an email from Diane popped up. I opened it thinking it was work-related. But no, it said, break up with Ed right now before everyone knows what a loser you are. He loves me, not you, and I have proof. Attached to the email were a bunch of pictures. Seriously? Could this actually be happening? My heart was pounding like crazy, and my hand was shaking as I clicked on the first image. I was on my way to Julia's house for a study sesh, when out of nowhere, I found myself flying onto the ground. I was so stunned, I didn't even see the ball that had hit me, or the fact there was a cute guy rushing over to check if I was okay. He helped me up and apologized. Then he pulled a band-aid out of his bag. Oh my, who is he? I'd scraped my hand pretty badly, but I almost didn't mind because now I was face to face with a gorgeous guy. In fact, I was so busy staring at him and blushing that I didn't even notice Julia marching towards us. Um, what are you two doing? Turns out the cute guy was Callum, Julia's boyfriend. Ugh, Julia. Of course, every nice thing is always hers. I'm Jenny, by the way, and that lucky girl is Julia. She's the daughter of the richest guy in town, Mr. Walsh. We're supposed to be friends, but we honestly have nothing in common. I mean, my family is pretty poor. It's not our fault, though. My dad sadly passed away, and so it's just me and my mom trying to make ends meet. Julia, on the other hand, has a silver spoon shoved down her throat. But fate still brought us together. I know it's kind of wrong, but that night I couldn't stop thinking about Callum. He now, in fact, gave me motivation for the next study session with bossy Julia, as maybe he would be there again. I even put on makeup, and skipping on the way to her house the next day. But, well, it was all for nothing, because Callum was nowhere to be seen. Instead, I had to sit and listen to Julia go on and on about her trip to Paris. I pretended that I was okay, but actually, I always dreamed of visiting the city of light and gazing up at the Eiffel Tower ever since watching Emily in Paris. Dream on, Jenny. Anyway, Julia was incessant. She loved making me look like a fool, and even said, Aw, poor Jenny. Maybe one day you'll get to go to Paris. But until then, you can just look at all my photos. Honestly, why was she so cruel to me? Last year around my birthday, she'd even shown me a fashion magazine and asked me which dress I liked best. I thought she was buying gifts for me, but instead, she showed up at my party in the exact dress I pointed out. I couldn't believe it. She just winked at me and laughed, and I seriously wanted to scream at her. Anyway. After looking at about one billion Paris pics, Mr. Walsh appeared. He looked happy to see us sitting so close and studying together. If only he knew the truth. But I had to pretend I had a lot of fun with Julia and helping her study, at least for his sake. Mr. Walsh was a good friend of our family, and ever since my dad passed away, he'd been looking out for me, and was even paying my school fees. I couldn't let him down. But you know what? I actually started to get excited to go over to Julia's now, as the thought of bumping into Callum again gave me butterflies. I even got myself a new hairstyle, but he was never there, and I always left feeling disappointed. Then one time, after school, 
It started to rain dogs and cats, and I had to run for it. Then suddenly I felt an umbrella over my head. Guess what? It was Callum coming to the rescue. It was like something out of a romantic movie. He even offered me a lift home. My heart was racing so hard I was afraid he'd hear it. I just sat there in silence dripping rain all over his clean car. I even caught him looking over at me a few times, and my heart felt like it was going to leap out of my chest. He pulled up at my house, so I was about to get out when he touched my arm and said, Can I get your number? I was confused. I mean, wasn't he Julia's boyfriend? He then explained that he was just hired to be her fake boyfriend so that all the flirty boys would get out of her way. Wow, I couldn't believe it. He asked me to keep it a secret as Julia would end us both if this story got out. Okay, it all made sense now. That's why he never came over to her house. I felt so happy. Over the next few days, Callum and I chatted a lot on the phone. And then eventually, he asked me out on a date. We went to the fun fair, and right away he held my hand. It made me feel so special, and I never wanted him to let go. We were having so much fun, then a familiar voice pierced the air. Well, well, well. Isn't that my dear friend, Jenny? I felt dread rush through my whole body. We turned around, and there was Julia and her girl gang all standing there with their arms crossed. Callum dropped my hand and rushed to Julia's side. It was all her, babe. You've got to see the messages she sent. She's been flirting with me for weeks. It's pathetic. Whoa, was he for real? A second ago, he was about to lean in for a kiss. And now he was bad-mouthing me? How could he be so two-faced? I tried to explain to Julia, but she wouldn't listen. She just called me a traitor in front of everyone and told all her friends to lock up their boyfriends in case I try it on with one of theirs next. I was devastated. Everyone was staring at me and judging me. Ugh, if only I could vanish into thin air right now. And as I was thinking about where I could escape to, a guy appeared, grabbed my wrist, and pulled me away. It was Stefan, the guy who lived across the road from me. I didn't understand why he helped me, but I was so grateful that he did. He walked me home and tried to cheer me up by saying how his mom used to love our bakery so much and that the carrot cake my mom made was his mom's fave. This made me smile, thinking back on all those happy times in our family bakery. When my dad had died, we'd had to sell it to pay off some debt, and life had become quite difficult. Luckily, Mr. Walsh was helping out, but after what just happened with Julia, I wasn't sure I'd be able to face him. The next day at school, everyone was staring at me. I couldn't even find a place to sit at lunch. What had I done? I'd ruined everything. And then it got worse. My phone beeped. It was Mr. Walsh. He said he was so disappointed in me and that I no longer needed to come and tutor his daughter. I wanted to cry, and at the same time I felt so much relief. But then I read on and he said, I'm sorry, but I can't keep my promise anymore. I'll continue to subsidize your school fees, but you'll have to figure something out for college. Good luck. My heart plummeted. Not only had I been shunned by everyone at school and backstabbed by Callum, but now the door to college was being slammed in my face, too. What would I do? My life was over. I felt so sick. I just walked out of the canteen and went home. I didn't dare go to school over the next few days. I was miserable. And just when I'd given up all hope, there was a knock at my door. It was Callum. What was he doing here? He said he was sorry for what had happened and that he missed me so much. Then he asked me if I'd be interested in being his secret girlfriend. What in the world? I was so angry, I wanted to slam the door in his face. But he was fast enough to catch my hand, which took me aback. At that exact moment, Stefan happened to walk past. Seeing me standing there with Callum, his face changed and he immediately walked away. Oh, no. I definitely couldn't let him misunderstand anything about me anymore. He's the only friend I had left. I yanked my arm away from Callum and chased after Stefan. I finally caught up with him and blurted out how I'd been feeling like the whole world was against me and that I didn't know what to do. He told me to calm down, then we went to sit on a bench in the park, as he let me confide everything in him. By the time I finished talking, I was on the verge of tears. Then he said, Listen, Jenny, you're better than this. Don't dim to fit in with those people at your school. Good people will see you for the real you. You're strong, and you can get through anything. I know you can. He was right. I was better than this. 
I didn't need to sink as low as Julia and her friends, and I certainly didn't need to rely on Mr. Walsh's money. I'd figure this out by myself, like I always did. So I applied for a part-time job at a coffee shop. Earning my own money felt so good. Suddenly I felt free, and I knew everything was going to be okay. But then one day when I was working, Julia and her gang came in. They still weren't over what happened, and in front of everyone, they brought up what I'd done to humiliate me, and they even recorded it, and I couldn't stop shaking. This was too much. That's when I threw a cup of coffee all over Julia and ran out of there. Julia shouted after me that she was going to tell my mom everything I'd done. Without a doubt, Julia really did it. She even sent my mom photos of me and Callum at the fair. And well, my mom didn't take it well. I rushed home to try and explain after mom yelled at me over the phone. But then I couldn't find mom anywhere. I called her phone and a man answered. He said my mom was in a hospital after she fainted? Oh dear good God! I got to the hospital immediately and found out that she had collapsed from shock. But thankfully she was okay. She had to stay in the rest of the day to be monitored. So I went to get us both a cup of coffee. That's when I saw him. Callum! He was in the ward next door sitting with some girl. I almost dropped the coffee out of shock. They looked close. I waited until he'd left, and then I went to ask the girl if Callum was her boyfriend. Well, turns out, they'd been dating for two years already. So he was triple cheating? The girl deserved to know the truth, so I took a deep breath and told her everything. She was so upset. We decided to get our own back. So the girl called Callum and asked him to come back. As soon as he arrived, we confronted him and got the truth once and for all. He was never Julia's real boyfriend. In fact, here's the shocking part. He was hired by Julia to pretend to date me and ruin my life. Apparently, she was jealous of how much attention her dad gave me since my dad had died, and that her dad constantly compared her to me. He kept apologizing to his girlfriend, saying how much he loved her and that he only agreed to help Julia so that he could earn some money to help pay for her medical bills. I was stunned. Callum was so apologetic and said he'd come clean about everything. He posted it on the school forum to clear my name and to everyone to see the ugly truth about Julia. And of course, when Mr. Walsh saw it, he made her come and apologize to me. And he also apologized himself and offered to pay my college fees again. Do you think I accepted his offer? Of course not. I was standing on my own feet now and there was no going back. I didn't need anyone's help. So you might be wondering how I could afford college. Surely not on my coffee shop salary, right? Well, after graduating high school, I realized how much I missed the bakery. That was where I truly felt happy. So I decided to study to become a pastry chef, and now my mom and I have opened a new bakery. I've never been happier. And there's one last thing I want to share. Oh, in fact, here he is. Hey, Stefan, I've made your mom's fave. Let's go surprise her. I couldn't stop smiling as Stefan took the carrot cake, kissed my cheek, and we headed for his car. Life is so much more simple now, and sweet, and I love it. My phone beeped with a new message. Emma, I've got something to do nearby, so let's meet there. See ya. It was from Tony, my childhood friend from the orphanage back in Missouri. Yep, that's right. I ended up in an orphanage after my mom passed away when I was only four years old. But things were even worse for Tony and him. They'd been left outside the orphanage door without anyone even knowing who their parents were. And now, here I am, on my way to visit his grave, as today's his death anniversary. <sighs> Time flies. I can hardly believe it's been ten years already. I picked up some flowers, then drove to the cemetery. Tony was already there waiting for me. I smiled and waved, but my heart felt heavy. Back when we were 14, we'd been joined at the hip, Tony, Thomas, and me. I had a secret crush on Thomas, but I never got the chance to tell him. It had all happened so fast on that day. We were just kids, young and dumb. We'd snuck out to go play by the riverbank. One minute we were splashing each other in the river, the next moment, Thomas was being carried away in the current. I tried to save him, but Tony pulled me back to shore. Even thinking about it now, I still couldn't help but burst into tears. Don't cry, Em. I'll always be here for you. And I knew he would be. 
Deep down, I knew Tony always had feelings for me. But I didn't feel the same way. <sighs> After that, Tony drove me home. Seeing my exhausted look, he said before I went inside, Get a good night's sleep, Em. Remember, we've got that interview tomorrow. Gosh, I almost forgot. Tony probably thought I was the worst employee ever. <laughs> and yes, you can guess it. Tony is my boss. After years in the orphanage, he was adopted by a super smart family that had inspired him to strive to become someone important, and he'd eventually built a food startup. Anyway, the following morning, despite still feeling worn out, I had no choice but to put on a brave face to go to work, as I had a marketing team to lead. But as I walked into the lobby, a guy bumped into me. He helped me up and frantically apologized, explaining he was in a rush. I looked up and was about to nag him, but wait, why does he look so familiar? In fact, he looked exactly like... It's you! You... I stammered, but I couldn't even finish my sentences because he'd rushed into the lift and the doors had closed. I must have been seeing things. Honestly, throughout the whole interview, I could barely concentrate. Could there be two people looking that similar on this earth? I was lost in thought when the next applicant came in, and it was him! Both Tony and I stared in shock. He was the splitting image of Thomas. But he couldn't be. I mean, Thomas had died years ago. We both were too stunned to say anything until his voice broke the silence. Hi, I'm Dustin, and I'm here to interview for the marketing position. I looked at Tony, and he looked just as confused as I did. But... Yeah, it wasn't Thomas. This guy was from Illinois and had never even been to Missouri. Okay, so here's Thomas's doppelganger. Fair enough. The interview went well, and even though he was a bit arrogant, he knew what he was doing, so we hired him. When I left the room, surprisingly, Dustin was still waiting for me outside. He offered to treat me to lunch as an apology for earlier. I agreed, as I was desperate to ask him more questions. During lunch, I kept mentioning the orphanage, some of Thomas's hobbies and things he hated, but Dustin didn't even bat an eyelid. I was disappointed, because I really hoped Dustin would actually be Thomas. That night, I barely slept. I couldn't stop thinking about Dustin. It's ridiculous, but I still had a strong feeling that he really was my childhood sweetheart. Suddenly, I got a message from Tony. Saw you hanging out with Dustin. Wake up, Em. He's not Thomas. Ugh. I didn't need to hear that. The next day, I couldn't take my eyes off of Dustin. At lunch, I watched as he put honey on his watermelon, and I almost freaked out. That was exactly what Thomas used to do. Oh my. I blurted out. I then told Tony what I just saw as soon as he sat down, but he just laughed and said, Honestly, Em, tons of people do that. Do you really think that our Thomas could be that arrogant? Seeing that I was still unfazed, he continued. But if you still want to check, just give him a peach. Things can change, but allergies don't, right? OMG, Tony was a genius. He probably was just kidding, but I was super serious. So the next day, I bought Dustin a peach pie to welcome him to the team. But to my surprise... He ate it up with pleasure and seemed totally fine. Okay, clearly I needed to let this go. He wasn't Thomas. End of. But if only things were that simple. And even though I knew Dustin wasn't Thomas, I still felt attracted to him. He was smart and sweet and so much fun to be around. Eventually, we started hanging out and became very close. We didn't actually make anything official, but we were low-key dating already. However, it was impossible to hide things from Tony. One time, our company went on a team bonding weekend, and we'd arranged a tennis competition. We had to pair up, so obviously I would go with Dustin, but as we're about to go sign up, then Tony came to ask me to be his partner too. My god, it was so awkward. Then Tony said in a very sulky tone, Okay, how about we have a little competition? The winner gets to pair up with Emma. And so, they had a swimming race. 
That's so embarrassing. I knew Dustin couldn't swim, so I started to panic. But he got in the pool anyway. Obviously, Tony won. But who cares? He was acting like a child. I rushed over to help Dustin, who was left coughing and choking on the water. And at that moment, I realized that I was falling for him so much. But since then, there were rumors in the company that Dustin was only flirting with me to get promoted. One morning, we were walking through the lobby together when two girls started whispering about us. So Dustin took my hand and went straight to the girls saying, I love Emma. What's wrong with that? Hmm, tell me. Go on. At that exact moment, Tony appeared and asked if he could have a word with Dustin in his office. I was so nervous. Now everyone knew we were in some weird triangle, and I didn't like it one bit. Then one of my colleagues overheard Tony telling Dustin that if he didn't leave me alone, he'd be fired. I couldn't believe it. I went to find Tony right away, and before I could even confront him, he said, Yes, it's true. I asked those girls to start the rumors, and I also asked that jerk to give up on you. It was me. I did it all. I just don't get it, Em. Why have I ever been good enough for you? Tony, wait. It's been ten years. Why couldn't you give me a chance? Why can't you let Thomas go? Some guy who looks like him walks up and you totally forget about me? He's a loser compared to Thomas. Don't you dare call him a loser, I said. See, in the end, you still care about him only, not me. Tony shouted and stormed off. I hated to be in this situation. On the one hand, I truly liked Dustin, but Tony was not only my lifesaver, but also my best friend, who'd stuck by my side through all the highs and lows. What a dilemma. In the end, I decided to have a little space from Dustin, just until things cooled down. Maybe then, the rumors would stop, and people would quit being so negative about him. But that wasn't to be so. You see, our new product that hadn't even been released yet suddenly appeared on the website of our direct competitor. Someone must have leaked the confidential file. But who? An investigation was opened and all of our computers were checked. You won't believe it, but the IT team had been able to recover a deleted email that had been sent to our rivals from Dustin's outbox. Dustin denied it and he demanded to check the CCTV. That's how we caught Mike, one of our senior employees, at Dustin's computer sneakily doing something. And to think, he'd put the blame on Dustin. After the truth came out, I went over to Dustin, but he seemed mad as he said, You think I'm a jerk too, don't you? That's why you've been giving me the cold shoulder. I told him I never believed he'd done it. Then I took his hand. I'm so sorry. It's just that I've been through some stuff. Then we hugged. Oh my, I missed him so much. But the drama didn't end there. The info leaked had caused our company huge losses. We had thousands of meetings, and the stress was unreal. Feeling so deflated, I went up to the rooftop to get some air. Suddenly, I heard Dustin's voice somewhere. He was on the phone with someone, talking about some plan to steal our company's products. No way! Without even thinking, I charged over and snatched his phone away to see that he was talking to... Mike? Oh. My. God. Had they been accomplices from the beginning? I was so angry, but actually more disappointed. So I asked him to resign and stay away from my sight. I know I should have exposed him to the whole company instead of letting him go that easy, but I guess my heart couldn't bear to do that. <sighs> I felt so bad, especially towards Tony, the best friend who's always by my side, while I was busy chasing after a jerk. I lost contact with Dustin after that, and I barely had time to think about it because our company was on the brink of bankruptcy. But one day, I got a call from him, followed by a message saying, Please don't ignore me. I've got something important to tell you. So we met up the next day at a coffee shop, and as soon as I saw him, I said, Look, Dustin, I've had enough of your lies. Please just get to the point. Then he replied, Emma, I admit that I only came to work for your company to steal your ideas. But seeing you and Tony after all these years, and falling for you all over again, well, that wasn't part of my plan. 
I was confused. After all these years? What are you talking about? Then he showed me his wrist, and he was wearing a friendship bracelet. Remember this? You gave it to me on my birthday ten years ago. O-M-G. What was going on? I couldn't believe my eyes. I'd given this to Thomas. But then why... But the peach... I continued. He just laughed and said, I overheard you guys' plan, so I made sure to take allergy meds just before. Then he went on to explain that he was Thomas, and that he'd been lucky enough to be saved that day on the river. There was a family who were out in the river searching for their drowned son, but instead of finding him, they found Thomas, and so they kindly adopted him and changed his name to their sons, Dustin. This was insane! Here was Thomas right in front of me, after all these years. And guess what? His adoptive father is the director of our rival company. And so he'd asked Dustin, or should I say Thomas, to come and infiltrate our company. Thomas kept apologizing for it, saying how much it had tormented him, and that he just missed me and had to tell me the truth. My head was spinning. This was all too much. I needed a moment to think it all through. But in the end, we decided that he could help our company by uploading a post to expose the truth. Obviously, as soon as Tony heard about it all, he was furious. He was mostly mad at me because I'd covered for Thomas. He'd even stopped talking to me for a while. But putting that aside, after Thomas's post, things got better for our company. We were able to launch new products as scheduled, and he even contributed some capital to help with our new project. Now our companies are still rivals, but at least it's now a fair competition. As for Tony and I, we eventually made up. He came to find me one day after work and said, Um, I'm so sorry for how childish I've been. I was just jealous of you and Thomas. I was too selfish to consider your feelings. But you and Thomas, I want you guys to be together. You two are made for each other. I couldn't stop crying as he said that. It meant so much to me. And guess what? It has now been a whole year since Thomas came back into our lives, and the three of us are back to being the best of friends. Oh, and I should probably add that Thomas and I are engaged. We're so happy, and we're even opening an orphanage together for homeless kids like us. I'm going through many phases, but I finally found peace in life. I guess it all worked out after all. So everyone loves Christmas, right? Trust me, it's not so great when your boss fires you in November. How was I supposed to buy presents now? Still, I tried to see the positives. I hated that boring, underpaid, overworked job anyway. My ex-boss Adrian was the worst. He's a crazy perfectionist who always gave me ridiculous deadlines, complained about every tiniest mistake, and flipped out if things didn't go his way. No wonder he was still single at 32. Who could ever stand him? I wouldn't miss him, or my tragic ass-kissing co-workers. Anyways, on the bright side, I'd get to spend the entire holiday season with my family and my boyfriend Matt in peace, without being bothered by any annoying work emails. I, in fact, have invited Matt over for Thanksgiving dinner with my parents, and plan to spend this cozy weekend with my loved ones. Then, the day before Thanksgiving, I packed up my car and was about to go and pick Matt up when my phone beeped. Sonia. I don't think Thanksgiving is a good idea. I just think we need some time apart. Hope you have a great time. See you around. X. What? Had he just broken up with me over text message? I immediately rang him up, but he turned his phone off. Just great. Here I was, stuck at home for the entire Thanksgiving and Christmas period, being a jobless, boyfriendless loser. To make it worse, even my little sister Gina had a boyfriend who adored her. This is so unfair. One night, my parents were out to buy a Christmas tree, and Gina had her boyfriend over to help put up Christmas lights and decorations. Well, needless to say, love was in the air, and that festive vibe didn't help at all with my misery. So I refused to join them and curled up in my room. Feeling so lonely and miserable, I downloaded Tinder. I usually wasn't one for dating apps, but I was feeling so low, I would have happily spoken to anyone. I didn't feel like being me, 
I was sick of being me, so I used the fake name Crystal and just put some artsy scenery pictures up. I could be whoever I wanted to be. And you know what? It seemed to be working, as a few guys wanted to talk to me. Okay, most of them were also bored, or only after one thing, but then there's this guy called Carl that caught my attention. Like me, he had no pictures of himself, but instead, he had images of song lyrics and movie quotes, including the quote, The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I love the movie Lost in Translation, so I sent him a message telling him he had good taste in films, and he messaged me back complimenting the scenery photos I took. After that, we started chatting days and nights. We talked about everything, from the dumb to the meaningful. He actually helped me out a lot and made the Christmas period bearable for me. It was all going great, until Christmas Eve. He sent me a message to wish me a Merry Christmas, along with, let's meet up for a drink. Oh no. Even though the app said he was only a few miles away, I wasn't ready for meetups. I actually was nervous upon reading his text. My heart was pounding, and I found myself worrying about what he would think of me when we met. What if he didn't look like what I imagined? What if he'd be disappointed when he saw me? Why does that even matter, though? Unless... I developed feelings for him. I don't even know anymore. But it's certain that I couldn't face him just yet. I politely refused his invitation. He was cool about it. Then we still continued to talk like normal. I survived Christmas. And then for New Year's Eve, Gina persuaded me to go to a party with her boyfriend and friends. I wasn't really keen to join, but I guessed I needed to do something to stop this gloominess. As I was walking in, I was so busy brushing off the snow on my shoulder that I bumped into a guy. To my horror, I looked up and saw that it was my old boss, Adrian. Why was he here, in my hometown? He was also shocked, but managed to smile at me. But I just gave him a glare, rolled my eyes, flipped back my hair, then strode off. What a mood killer! I grabbed a drink and sat in the corner in an attempt to avoid bumping into Adrian again. Gina found me and tried dragging me onto the dance floor, but I refused. Then she winked at me and in a tipsy voice said, You need a man to dance with. I'll be right back. Five minutes later, she excitedly waved at me and shouted over, Found one! I just want to facepalm as I saw her dragging Adrian by the hand over to me. Talk about awkward. But still, I mumbled out a hi, downed a shot for courage, and then chatted to him. Okay, it turns out he was visiting his grandparents who lived around here, and he was actually an okay guy to talk to. After I spent most of the night talking to him, he bought a drink, then said to me, I have to admit that after the death stare you gave me on entry, I was afraid for my life. But it turns out, I've enjoyed chatting with you. Sorry, I blushed. No, it's okay. I'd be mad with me too if I were you. Letting you go from work was nothing personal. I had to let one person go, and... I only chose you because I knew you were wasted there. Um, thanks, I guess, I laughed. Let's get another shot. Okay, so maybe Adrian wasn't that bad of a person after all. And I don't know if it's because of all the drinks we downed, the atmosphere, or the fact that everyone else around us was sharing New Year's kisses, that I almost felt like Adrian looked like he wanted to kiss me on the strike of midnight too. And I too didn't dodge it. Luckily, nothing happened. I mean, that would have been weird, right? The next day, Adrian messaged me, saying he would help me set up a job interview at a big media company. Wow, that's amazing! Now I had no excuse to sulk around anymore. I needed to get back to the city and sort my life out. Only, I still couldn't get Carl out of my head. I guessed these feelings were real. To clear up my mind, I decided to confess to him online. But then he messaged me back, saying... I think you're great, and I love talking to you, but I have a crush on my coworker. I'm sorry, but I'd like to stay friends. Ouch! Rejection hurt! Back in the city, I felt lonelier than ever. Yes, I'd got the new job, and it was going well, but I was sick of seeing loved-up couples everywhere. To make it worse, Gina came to stay with me for a while, and she's always on the phone, giggling and FaceTiming her boyfriend. Now I couldn't even escape lovebirds in my own apartment. Feeling down, I messaged Carl again, just casually asked him to meet up later this weekend when I would be back home again for my mom's birthday. Well, to be honest, I just couldn't give him up just yet. Maybe he would change his mind when we met? Or I would be able to get over him once we meet. But he made up some excuse to reject me again. That was it, I told myself. It's official over now. Depressed, I called Adrian up for a drink. He arrived looking kinda cute. 
but the sting of rejection was still on my mind. I confided to Adrian, and I asked him if he thought Carl was a fool for turning me down. Adrian slammed his drink onto the table and turned to me and said, You're the fool. Why are you stupidly chasing after some guy online? He might not even be real. He might be some 60-year-old pervert. Why won't you just open your eyes and look in front of you? Then he stood up, locked me in his arms, and tried to kiss me. What? I was so mad I pulled myself away from him and slapped him straight across the face before I stomped off. He was meant to be my friend, not some guy after just one thing. I was so hurt, I cried while texting Carl about what just happened, but he didn't reply. The next day, I woke up with a pounding head and puffy eyes. I checked my phone. Adrian had called me, but nothing from Carl. He must have been too busy with his coworker, huh? Suddenly, I heard the door knock. My sister answered it and told me it was Adrian. I reluctantly went out to see him. I mean, I guess I needed to at least hear him out. He was standing there looking sheepish as he said, I'm so sorry about last night, Sonia. I was slightly drunk and I guess I've read the signals wrong. For what it's worth, I think that Carl guy is a fool for letting you go. You're amazing. I wasn't in the mood to talk to him, so said it was fine, then told him to leave. I closed the door and threw myself on the sofa. Then about ten minutes later, there was someone at the door again. I answered it, and there was Adrian, but this time, he changed his outfit. Confused, I grumbled, what else do you want? Then, he politely greeted me. Hello, Crystal. Let me introduce myself. I'm Carl. We've been talking for months. I guess, if you think about it, the more you know who you are, and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I stared at him open-mouthed. He just quoted Lost in Translation, and he'd called me Crystal. Then reality struck me. OMG! All this time, and Adrian was Carl? I dragged him inside. We sat down on the sofa and talked everything out. It's so unreal! Turns out the guy I've been chasing after is literally right in front of me. How ironic! I was so happy I hugged him and broke down crying, apologizing. Right then, my sister walked out from the kitchen, took one look at us, and laughed out, Well, 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 isn't this the awful boss who fired you? But most importantly, isn't he the guy I brought to you at the New Year's Eve party? You two owe me big time. We all burst out laughing. So, yeah, after a horrid holiday season, now I finally could start a promising new year with a great job and a pretty awesome new boyfriend. I guess things always have a way of working out in the end, right? Thank you for listening to my story, and wish you guys a good start into the new year!